Decision 84 election night continues. Sponsored by Manufacturers Hanover, the financial source worldwide. By the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. And by AT&T, we're reaching out in new directions. Now from the NBC News Election Center in New York, here is Tom Brokaw. Good evening, everyone. It is now 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and uh, a number of key states have closed their polls just in the last couple of minutes. Illinois, Massachusetts, Michigan, Missouri, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Texas, Oklahoma, and, of course, many other states, especially in the West, still have their polls open. But if the current trend continues, and there is every expectation that it will, this is going to be perhaps an historic night for Ronald Reagan because he is running a very strong race at this point. He is winning all of the states that he had to win in the South and in the Midwest. And the indications are that this could be a very big night for Ronald Reagan. We want to add two more states right now to Ronald Reagan's column. The state of New Hampshire, four electoral votes there. New Hampshire really beat up on Mondale twice this year. Gary Hart won the primary, and now Ronald Reagan wins in the general election. And also in the Great Plains, the state of Kansas. Color the state of Kansas blue with its seven electoral votes for uh, Ronald Reagan. Lyndon Johnson is the only Democrat to win Kansas since 1936. Ronald Reagan keeps the streak going tonight. And another big industrial Midwestern state, Ronald Reagan, the winner in the state of Michigan with its 20 electoral votes. Again, a state with severe economic difficulties during the past four years of the Reagan administration. But tonight, it awards its electoral votes to Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan has won all of the states that we have been able to project up to this point. And as you can see, the map now is beginning to fill in blue for Ronald Reagan. When Walter Mondale wins the state, those states will be colored uh, red. In the industrial northeast, another key win for Ronald Reagan. NBC News now able to project the state of New Jersey for Ronald Reagan. 16 electoral votes there. The Democrats had hoped that the blue collar vote in New Jersey and especially the addition of an Italian Catholic on the ticket, Geraldine Ferraro, would help them in New Jersey, but apparently it has not. Another key win, 16 electoral votes out of, New Hampshire, out of New Jersey for Ronald Reagan. 270 electoral votes are required. Ronald Reagan is marching steadily toward that number, and it seems toward a much higher number. 166 he has added up at this hour, 8 p.m. in these. So far, no states that we have been able to call for Walter Mondale. Three percent of the precincts have reported in nationwide. We're beginning now to see some votes, and as you can see, the lead that President Reagan and Vice President Bush have over Walter Mondale and Geraldine Ferraro is overwhelming at this time. That's a 24-point lead at this hour. That, of course, could change. We do want to take this opportunity to remind you that NBC News projects only after most, or if not all, all of the states have uh, all the polls in the state have closed, and we've begun to see some of the returns from that state. Now, in the upper Midwest, in the Great Plains, right up there in the Canadian border, the state of North Dakota, with farm difficulties, difficulty in the farm economy out there, still the winner, Ronald Reagan. Color North Dakota blue for Ronald Reagan. Lyndon Johnson, once again, the only Democrat to win North Dakota since 1936. So we'll add those electoral votes to Ronald Reagan's column, and he now has 169. 169 electoral votes for Ronald Reagan. There was a lot of talk during the course of this campaign that Jesse Jackson would make the difference, especially in the South, which has been solid Republican territory in presidential elections. Well, look what happened tonight in one of the big southern states, the state of Texas. NBC News now projecting Ronald Reagan, the winner in Texas. 29 electoral votes. That's blue on our map. A Democratic governor down there. They split their... Uh, their Senate seats, but Ronald Reagan gets their presidential votes in the state of Texas. Tonight, 198 electoral votes for Ronald Reagan, now less than 100 away from the magic number of 270 that he requires to win. Let me show you now uh, how the vote is shaping up in the South. It is a blowout for Ronald Reagan down there. Let's take a few key states if we can. First of all, in South Carolina, four years ago, Ronald Reagan won just by 1% of the vote in South Carolina, which has a heavy black population. Tonight, winning by more than 30 points in South Carolina. The Democrats had hoped that Jesse Jackson and a voter registration drive would make a big difference. So far, no indication that it has. In Mississippi, about the same situation. Well, four years ago, Ronald Reagan won by just 1% of the vote there. Again tonight, he's winning by nearly 30 points in Mississippi, which has a black population of 28% of the registered voters in that state. In the state of Georgia, Jimmy Carter's home state, four years ago, the Carter-Mondale ticket won it. 
this year Ronald Reagan is winning it by 20 points in the state of Georgia and in Florida in Florida Ronald Reagan 3% of the precincts in so far the ticket of Reagan and Bush winning over the ticket of Ferraro and Mondale as you can see about a 30 point spread at this hour and according to our analysis now uh, they have been winning almost all of the voting groups in Florida another big state on the eastern seaboard Democrats had hopes for this one as late as this afternoon Pennsylvania 25 electoral votes they go into the Ronald Reagan column now that is a state with a lot of steel workers in the western part of the state. Reagan uh, ruled against them in terms of import quotas recently. Color it blue for Ronald Reagan, Pennsylvania. Lots of electoral votes there. That means that he is now less than 50 votes away from the 270 that he requires for election tonight, winning in Pennsylvania. It's more than a numerical story. It's a big philosophical story as well, a phenomenal American political story tonight that is developing for Ronald Reagan. 4% of the precincts have reported so far. This is the national vote total as we have it. As you can see, there is a lead there of 22 points for Ronald Reagan and Vice President George Bush. Things are looking very good for him at this hour. We'll be back with more election returns, not only in the presidential race, but also in the important Senate and House races as well. Back from NBC News election headquarters right after this. NBC News continues counting the vote and showing the mood and the shape of the country tonight. On election night 1984, we're now able to project the District of Columbia for Walter Fritz Mondale, the Democratic candidate for President of the United States, three electoral votes. The District of Columbia is colored red now on our national map for Walter Mondale. He gets on the board. The Electoral College total, however, is very much against him at this hour. We'll show that to you right now. Walter Mondale has just three electoral votes. And look at President Reagan. President Reagan with 223 driving toward re-election. The magic number is 270. A reminder, polls are open in many states, especially in the West. There are lots of issues to be decided and a lot of races to be decided as well. You have the opportunity to vote still in those Western states. The president tonight, however, is doing extremely well at this hour. It is now just a few minutes after 8 Eastern time. Roger Mudd has some uh, results for us at this time in the Senate races, I think. Roger? Tom, we've uh, got a list, and we'll just work our way through from top to bottom, beginning in Texas. In the Texas Senate race, the projected winner tonight is Republican Philip Graham. He used to be a Democrat, and he must have pulled a lot of Democrats along with him, because tonight he defeated the Democratic uh, State Senator Lloyd Doggett. In New Hampshire, the Republican incumbent Gordon Humphrey, the projected winner, defeating re Democrat uh, Norman Demours. Humphrey re-elected for his second term. In Tennessee, we just heard Howard Baker, and his replacement in the Senate is Albert Gore, Jr., the son of a senator. Albert Gore, the projected winner, a Democrat, defeating uh, Republican State Senator Victor Ashe. In Maine, Republican incumbent William Cohen re-elected tonight to his second term. He defeated the Democratic uh, State House Majority Leader Elizabeth Mitchell. Cohen, the winner in Maine. In Kansas, Nan Nancy Kassebaum, the daughter of Alf Landon, re-elected to her second term. Uh, Mrs. Kassebaum uh, defeated uh, James Mayer, a Kansas City banker. In New Jersey, the Democratic incumbent William Bradley re-elected to his mm. second term. He defeated the mayor of Montclair, Mary Mosheri, who spent about $600,000 and moved two points in the polls. And finally, in Oklahoma, the Democratic incumbent, David Boren, the former governor, re-elected to his second term, defeating the uh, Republican, William Crozier. Boren, the uh, projected winner in Oklahoma. So let's take a rundown now of the other Senate races we've called, beginning with the great upset of the evening so far in Kentucky. The new winner, the new senator from Kentucky, Republican Mitch McConnell, defeating the Democratic incumbent Walter Huddleston. In Alabama, the projected winner, Democrat Howell Heflin, defeating Albert Lee Smith. In South Carolina, re-elected to his fifth term, 81-year-old Strom Thurmond. In Georgia, re-elected Sam Nunn, Sam Nunn the Democrat. In Virginia, John Warner, Republican, re-elected tonight, defeating Edith Harrison, the Democrat. And in Mississippi, the Republican incumbent Thad Cochran, defeating the former Democratic governor of Mississippi, uh, William Winter. Tom? 
It's Thank yours. You. Thank you, Roger. Uh, as you work your way through that list of states, I have a new uh, set of states that we can now project that Ronald Reagan is the winner. Let us begin now in Tennessee. You'll recall that four years ago, he barely won that state, about 4,000 votes altogether. Tonight, Ronald Reagan is the winner of the electoral votes in Tennessee, color that blue. The South beginning to be a solid blue block for Ronald Reagan on our NBC News election map. In the state of Connecticut, in the Northeast, in New England, the state of Connecticut, Ronald Reagan, the winner in Connecticut tonight, eight electoral votes in Connecticut, according to our analysis of the votes that have been released and, of course, the people that we talked to today as they left the voting place. Connecticut goes in the Reagan column. And down in the southwest, which is solid Reagan territory, Oklahoma, Roger was just talking about the re-election of Senator Bourne, but the state of Oklahoma goes to Ronald Reagan tonight, according to our projection, eight electoral votes in Oklahoma. They all go to Ronald Reagan, so that, too, is a blue state on our map. Blue is the color of victory for Ronald Reagan tonight. 270 electoral votes needed for election. Ronald Reagan is now just 20 votes away from the magic number. Walter Fritz Mondale, the Democratic candidate for president, has three. They came from the District of Columbia. Uh, in Washington tonight, one of the uh, president's uh, chief political advisors, in fact, one of his oldest friends, is there at the headquarters, and he is Lynn Knopfsiger. Let's go to him now. Tom, thank you. There is nothing but joy here at Republican headquarters, and there is growing excitement as the tallies are put on the big map over our shoulder. Among the uh, six or 7,000 people here growing more and more excited, I believe, is Lynn Knopfsiger, who is a uh, consultant to the Reagan Bush campaign. Mr. Knopfsiger, any surprises for you this evening? Oh, the surprise is the size so far of the victory. I didn't think it would be quite this big. I didn't think the margin would be this big. And I thought we might lose four or five states. Now I'm beginning to think that we can get away with only losing one or two. Is this a mandate or is it a win? Oh, it's going to have to be a mandate, something this size. Uh, the president uh, clearly has the American people behind him, and that makes it a mandate. If I can look ahead to 1988, a little prematurely perhaps, uh, you're known for your overall political views. Where does George Bush stand right now in all of this? Well, George Bush is going to have to go out and win the presidency. Being vice president doesn't make you automatically succeed, and I'm sure there are other Republicans out there who are going to uh, challenge him for that. Do you think he helped himself or hurt himself at all during this campaign with the controversy that surrounded his remarks? Oh, I think that he's probably helped himself a little. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I think he's really done well. Lynn Knopfsiger, thank you very much, sir. Tom? Thanks very much. Emory King with Lynn Knopfsiger. He's been with the president, as I said, since 1966, but he's still an unmade bed in terms of his personal appearance. He's one of the shrewdest political advisors that the president has. Election night, 1984. We'll continue from the NBC News election headquarters after this. We're back at the NBC News election headquarters where it looks like a very big night for Ronald Reagan. So far, he has won all of the states that we've been able to project. Walter Mondale has won the District of Columbia so far. By the way, if Reagan is re-elected, he'll be the first in 12 years you would recall that uh, Richard Nixon was re-elected, but he could not serve out his full term. And if he serves his full term, he'll be the first since Dwight Eisenhower to do that. Roger Mudd now with a race uh, that has been getting a lot of attention in the northeastern part of the United States for the U.S. Senate. Roger. It sure has, Tom. It's the Massachusetts seat being vacated by Democrat Paul Songus. And tonight we have a projected winner, and it's John Kerry. He's the old Vietnam, well, not the old, but the young Vietnam uh, veteran. He's the Democratic lieutenant governor of the state. And he has defeated, according to our projection, the Republican incumbent, uh, Ray Shammy, who tied himself tightly to Ronald Reagan. And interestingly enough, one of the critical elements in that vote was the number of uh, women votes that uh, Lieutenant Governor Kerry received. Men split about evenly between Kerry and Shammy, but almost two-thirds of Massachusetts women who voted today voted for John Kerry. I must say he does look like a, a model at times, doesn't he? Well, he, he's a man who's been around for a long time. Many people may remember him as a, one of the Vietnam veterans against the war. He testified in Washington. He threw some medals against the Capitol steps. It turns out that they were borrowed medals at the time and that and, later developed. And his remained in his uh, glass uh, case at home. Well, that's, uh, that's an interesting... There was some uh, talk of, uh, of the Republicans picking up that state, but they needed a, a major uh, Reagan uh, vote to do it. 
There are other interesting uh, Senate races this evening. One of them is a very close one in West Virginia, and there John D. Rockefeller the fourth is running for the seat being vacated by Jennings Randolph. His opponent is Republican John Racy. That's a close one we'll be watching this evening. And also in Illinois, where the Republican chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Charles Percy, is locked in a close race with Democrat Paul Simon. That's a, uh, an important one for uh, the future of uh, foreign policy and the Republican Party. We have a report now from the Percy headquarters, where Mary Nissenson is our reporter this evening. Mary? Roger, there's a lot more optimism than there are people right now at Percy headquarters. Percy's people say that he has been showing strongly in the polls. All the published polls have shown him winning, and that despite the closeness of this race, they believe Percy will win in the final outcome. Now, there's been very heavy voter turnout in Illinois. It is not possible yet to say how that will affect this race. The conventional wisdom is that if it's heavy rural turnout, that will favor the Republican. Heavy turnout in the city, that will favor the Democrat. But there has been some unhappiness among the farmers with Percy, so that heavy rural turnout may not uh, follow the conventional wisdom in this case. This race has been as bitter as it has been hotly contested. The ad campaigns for those voters in other states who haven't seen them have really been something special. They have accused the candidates of being everything from liars to lizards. Now, this race could have a very important impact on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee if Percy loses his bid tonight and Senator Jesse Helms of North Carolina wins his, then Helms could replace Percy, and that, of course, is one of the reasons why this race is one of the most closely watched anywhere in the nation. From Percy headquarters in Chicago, I'm Mary Nissenson. Back to you, Roger, in New York. And, Mary, one more uh, projection this evening in the Senate races in Delaware. The incumbent Democrat Joe Biden is the pro projected winner, and he's defeated the... Uh the uh, House Majority Leader in the Delaware uh, Legislature, John Burroughs. Joe Biden, the projected winner in Delaware. And Tom, if I said uh, Ray Shammy was the incumbent, I didn't mean to. What I said was that Paul Songus was vacating Massachusetts. The seat is open, and the projected winner is John Kerry over Ray Shammy. Okay, Roger, I wasn't going to put that mark against you at all. But well, I mean, somebody said in my ear that I'd made this mistake. Well, yeah, there are all kinds of voices in your ear <laughs> on these kinds of nights. By the way, we have another state that we can now add to the Ronald Reagan column. That is the state of Delaware along the eastern seaboard. Three electoral votes. Uh, it is important in other ways as well, and that is that since 1952, Delaware has always voted with the winner in American presidential elections. So Delaware, the <laughs> color blue, for Ronald Reagan tonight, we add those electoral votes to his total. And uh, things are going swimmingly for him at this time. This is the Electoral College total as we now have it, 253, less than 20 away for President Reagan from the magic number of 270 that he requires for election. And of course, if this current trend continues, it will be much more than just an Electoral College landslide. It could be a popular vote landslide <coughs> as well, and the president could win most of the states in the country as it is filling in there tonight. The Democrats had some hopes, for example, for Pennsylvania, John, in the closing days of the campaign, the closing they hours. They did. The they, had, they had hopes for uh, a number of those states. They really thought Pennsylvania might come. We don't know yet about New York. Uh, but the way things are going, you have to say that uh, the polls are closed in New York, are they not? Yeah. Uh, no, they're not closed until 9. Another 40 minutes, I think. Well, uh, then New York is still out there to be considered. But the way that is beginning to color in, it looks terribly good for the president. Well, especially in Pennsylvania, a state with a lot of union people, uh, a Democratic mayor in Philadelphia, big black population. The president ruled against the steel workers in effect for western Pennsylvania when he said, no, I'm not going to put the trade barriers up. He did that in the course of this campaign. Democrats thought that they had a real shot at it. That is also the evidence that we're seeing in the state of Ohio. Well, if you take, uh, I just went back before we began to talk and checked my two Indiana House districts, those bellwethers out there, uh, the little determining factors about Reagan. And those two Democratic in incumbents in Muncie and Evansville are not having any easy time tonight. They're on their way out. So there could be a coattail factor in all this. Well, already, got, already is. Yeah, we've got, a, we've got a lot to report tonight. And, of course, polls still remain open in many uh, states. We'll be back, but that's where the election stands at this time. Decision 84 election night continues. Sponsored by Sun Company. Where there's sun, there's energy. By AT&T, we're reaching out in new directions. And by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? Now from the NBC News Election Center in New York, 
Here is Tom Brokaw. Good evening once again. I'm here with John Chancellor and Roger Munn, and we're watching a really phenomenal development tonight as Ronald Reagan continues to roll through the country. So far, Walter Fritz Mondale has won only the District of Columbia. All those states that you see behind me that are colored blue are the states that we have projected Ronald Reagan the winner in tonight. The polls remain open, of course, in the West and in the Pacific Northwest. That is Ronald Reagan territory. You still have the opportunity to vote there not just for the presidency, of course, but for the many state and local issues that are on the ballot, as well as the congressional and Senate races that are at stake there. But if this trend continues, Ronald Reagan will be one of the most popular presidents of modern times. You remember that Dwight Eisenhower won by an overwhelming margin when he ran in 1952, a 55 to 44 margin. Four years ago, Ronald Reagan won by a similar margin, and this time he may exceed Eisenhower's second re-election total. Here's the electoral college vote as we have it right now. 405 votes for Ronald Reagan. He has exceeded uh, the Electoral College total that his uh, pollster Dick Worthland said that he would get 400. Uh, Fritz Mondale with only three. So that makes it an Electoral College landslide alone. And here's what's going on with the national vote. 27% of the precincts have reported in so far. The Reagan margin now has dropped a wee bit. It's down from 21, 22 points down to 18 points. It's still in the landslide proportions but it has dropped two or three percentage points in the last hour or so as we count the national vote. We are keeping track of 13 governor's races tonight as well. We want to share some of those with you. Republicans have been doing well, but in the state of Arkansas, the Democrats, 38-year-old Bill Clinton, elected to his third term. Look at that boyish face, and he's already been in office three times in Arkansas. Elected once, then defeated, came back, and now he's been elected successfully to a second term in Arkansas. But in Rhode Island, the state of Rhode Island, Edward DePret, who is the mayor of Cranston, Rhode Island, and a Republican. That governor's office goes from a Democrat to a Republican this time, Joe Gary, retiring in Rhode Island. And in Missouri, the Republicans hang on to the governor's uh, chair out there, Kip Bond retiring, and John Ashcroft, the attorney general of the state of Missouri, another Republican, is the winner in Missouri tonight. We want to show you some vote returns around the country in some of these governor's races. In the tiny state of Vermont, with 22% of the precincts reporting in, we have an interesting situation developing up there tonight. Madeline Coonan is attempting to become the first woman to be elected governor of Vermont, and it is a very close race as we have it at this time. Madeline Coonan running a very close race in Vermont. In West Virginia, here's the situation in West Virginia. Jay Rockefeller vacated the governor's office in West Virginia so that he could run for the U.S. Senate. Roger Mudd earlier tonight projected that he would win that seat. And in West Virginia, we are projecting that Arch Moore will be elected governor of that state, even though he is now trailing in the popular vote with a quarter of the precincts counted so far. In North Carolina, in North Carolina, again, a Republican picks up the seat. That is Congressman James Martin. He's 48 years old. He beat the Attorney General of North Carolina, Rufus Edmonston, who was the counsel to Sam Urban during the Watergate hearings. In Delaware, in Delaware, 83 percent of the precincts reporting there, the governor's office stays Republican. With the winner is Michael Castle. He is the lieutenant governor of that state, and he was the hand-picked successor of the outgoing governor, Pete DuPont. And in Missouri, I think that's all the returns that we have in Missouri for governor. 43% of the precincts in so far. This is the popular vote. Ashcroft, a runaway winner over uh, Rothman, who is the lieutenant governor of the state, 57 to 43. So a big Republican win with nearly half the precincts reporting in Missouri so far. That's where we stand in some of the governor's races around the country. Republicans doing well there as well. And perhaps it may be the coattail effect. Roger Mudd has uh, been keeping track of uh, some of the congressional races. More important, the balance of power in the House of Representatives in the second Reagan term. Philosophically, will it be more conservative, more liberal, more moderate? Roger's now prepared to answer those questions for, <laughs> for all of us. Aren't you, Roger? Well, I'll, uh, I'll take a crack at it. Uh, NBC News is now ready to take a first rough cut of what, uh, what we think the 99th Congress is going to look like in the House of Representatives, and this is the way we think it's going to be. It'll tighten up after a while, but this is it. The new House, 250 Democratic seats, 185 Republican seats. Uh, that is a net gain for Republicans of 17. If they had gained 26, they would be back where they were uh, two years ago. That means the Democratic majority of 99 now drops to 65. That's the number. A pickup, a, an estimated Republican pickup of 17 seats. They had hoped to get 26. 17 is our rough estimate. We'll be refining that later on as more of these House races come in. 
Now let's take a look at the uh, ideological division in what we think the new house will be. The new house, liberal, 218, conservatives, 217. That is a uh, conservative gain of Aye. approximately 14. And that gives what we think uh, will be uh, to the new house in the 99th Congress a one vote liberal majority. Of course, when you talk about majorities and minorities, it, it all depends on what the vote is, because those are changing sands and changing combinations. Uh, well, but Roger, what do you think that would mean, say, for the MX, which is going to come up? Well, let's see. The MX, uh, my recollection is the MX has always had, the anti-MX block in the House has always had a 33-vote margin. That's the, that's the MX yeah. vote. So 17 uh, cuts it in half, but does not reduce it. I think that means that still in the House of Representatives, there is not majority opinion for the funding of the MX. On, say, the uh, aid to the covert, uh, covert aid in Nicaragua, that has always uh, 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 carried by just a vote or two. Uh, what? Not carried by a vote or two, so this might change that. Can we agree that the headlines tomorrow may say that the Republicans didn't do as well in the House as they had expected or hoped to do, uh, given the size of the President's lead tonight, uh, and that uh, the coattails of the President were not as long as the Republicans would have liked? Well, if it stays no. where it is, which and that could change, of course, but if it stays there with only a 17-vote gain, I think that that's absolutely the case. But, uh, let me correct myself. Uh, the, 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 the MX margin was, it was very narrow. Uh, that's what the, I thought. The, the funding of, uh, of the covert aid in Nicaragua was, uh, was a greater margin than that. I think uh, that the House still will be unwilling to fund covert aid in Nicaragua. It may now be willing, however, to go ahead with the MX. Roger, we had a little uh, one graphic from our poll that we could put up that would tell us a little bit about uh, why this happened. If you look there, you'll see that we're talking about party loyalty, people who voted for Reagan and then also voted for a Democrat. Of those who did split their tickets and vote Democratic today for, say, a member of the House, 19 percent, almost one in five of Reagan's voters did turn in the voting booth and vote for a Democrat. And among those who did have party loyalty, of course, that's 77 percent, but the 19 percent, one of, out of five all of, of all those voters, is the key there, it seems to me, because our poll shows that among the Mondale voters, only 7 percent switched over and voted for any Republican office holder. So the Democrats held their party loyalty yeah. a lot better than the Republicans did today. Well, that's going to be a key thing that we're going to be watching uh, throughout the evening here at NBC. What happens in the House of Representatives, the plus or minus gain for the... Uh, for the Republicans and, of course, the philosophical shift of the House as well. I've just been talking on the phone with someone who has been seeing Walter Mondale in Minnesota, and he says, Mondale's doing real well. It's uh, what didn't come as a total surprise to him. He talked to some members of his staff, and he's a pro. He's been at this a long time. He's been in electoral politics now for, what, 35 years or something? Still a big blow, no question about it, but he had great crowds at the end, and that must have been comforting to him. We'll be back with more on Election 84 right after this. Continuing now our coverage on Decision 1984 from the NBC News Election Headquarters here in New York. We can now add another Western state, Ronald Reagan's total. Actually, it was his best state four years ago. He won 73 percent of the vote in Utah. It has five electoral votes. It's a very conservative state. And Utah tonight is colored blue on our NBC News election map. That goes into the Ronald Reagan column as uh, we begin to move this map westward. And the blue wave moves with the map at the same time. Polls remain open in California and many of the Western and Pacific Northwestern states. That means on the Electoral College total now, Ronald Reagan has 410 votes. Walter Mondale still back there at only three. He has won so far tonight by our calculations, only the District of Columbia. However, Iowa and Minnesota and Massachusetts are yet to be counted. Here's the national vote. We're approaching now 30%. And as you can see, the Reagan-Bush uh, lead over Mondale and Ferraro is 18 points. It was as high as 22 points for a time, but now it's uh, drifted back to 18 points. It still is a win of great proportions for the President of the United States tonight as he goes into a second term. Uh, two people who have been very active in uh, national politics in the course of this past year, one as a candidate for the Democratic presidential nomination, one who is expected to be a candidate for the Republican nomination for president in four years are with us at this time. 
Jack Kemp is in Buffalo, New York tonight. He's the Republican congressman from that area. And in Denver, Colorado tonight, we have Senator Gary Hart, who is standing by. He, of course, contested uh, Walter Mondale for the Democratic presidential nomination. We begin with you, if I may, Senator Hart. We had a lot of these late night conversations. Maybe we can begin this one on a slightly different plane. How are the Democrats going to be able to put themselves back together after this election? I was talking with one earlier today, and he said that the message is quite simple. Democrats are going to have to convince the nation that they're as interested in expanding the pie as they are in cutting it up. Is that a fair summary? Oh, I think it is, and it's uh, frankly one of the issues that I try to put forward for our party uh, in the nomination race. But I am very optimistic about the future of this party, primarily because of the caliber and quality of the elected officials we have in the Congress and that we're putting forward for all offices. There are a new generation of leaders coming on that understand the need for our party to lead in economic growth and opportunity and also to reform our defenses so that we can afford to defend this country without bankrupting the Treasury. And that's exactly what our, our leadership is going to do in the 80s and 90s. Jack Kemp in Buffalo, New York, let me ask you, a lot of people were concerned, Republicans and Democrats, by the way, that the president may end up this evening with a blank check, do whatever he wished that he could do. According to our calculations, you'll pick up about 17 seats in the House. That could change one way or the other. Do you think you have a blank check for the next couple of years? No, I don't think any elected official, Tom, has a blank check. But there certainly is a mandate to the president and to those of us who are re-elected to the Congress and new men and women elected to the new Congress to keep the country growing, make it grow even more. I think the mandate that I hear from the electorate tonight all over this country, and I know in my hometown of Buffalo, New York, is to bring down unemployment, balance the budget through more economic growth. If we're not balancing the budget through growth, what steps can we take towards simplification of the tax code and monetary reform and things like enterprise zones to get those deficits down, get unemployment down, bring down interest rates. There's where the mandate is, at least as I read it. Senator Hart, do you have any argument with that? Oh, yes, I do. Uh, because of the kind of campaign Ronald Reagan chose to wage, he does not have a mandate. What we had was a personality contest. The president uh, and his, his keepers and advisors kept him away from presenting any kind of a concrete vision for this country's future any kind of a, a policy to reindustrialize America or to train our workers or to reverse the, the arms race instead of expand it into space, uh, I think Ronald Reagan missed a, a, a wonderful opportunity uh, to create a mandate for himself. He cannot go to the Congress now with any blueprint for this nation's future and claim that the American people voted for it. Jack Kemp, what Tom, about I, that? I, well, I strongly disagree with Gary Hart. Uh, it is so obvious that the things that the president was talking about were closer to the mainstream of what the American people want for this country. They want private enterprise growth, not more growth of the public sector, government. They want tax simplification and lower rates, something that Gary Hart and Walter Mondale have refused to talk about. And they want the enterprise zone bill passed to reach out to minorities and inner city people to get them back to work. I think the president has a strong mandate. It's one to preserve peace through strength and to uh, achieve full employment without inflation in the next uh, two to three years. And if we achieve that type of uh, economic prosperity at home without inflation and strong chances for peace and democracy throughout the world, I think the Republican Party will be the emerging majority party well into the next century. Jack Kemp, let me ask you, uh, more than a half million people fell below the poverty line in the last four years in the Reagan administration. Do you expect that number to go even higher in the next four years? No, I think it'll go down. Uh, the only way out of poverty, uh, Tom, is with a job. And uh, if we can bring about uh, the entrepreneurial climate in this country that can bring down unemployment to 4% or 4.5%, uh, I am convinced uh, with things like enterprise zones and tax reform and monetary reform and international monetary reform to boost exports, clearly uh, that rise in poverty that took place increasingly so in the late 1970s, which slowed down in the 1983-84 time frame, can turn around and we can provide that bigger pie that many of our Democratic friends talk about, but they have lost the key to providing for the inner city poor. Very quickly, let me ask you just both for a brief answer to this question. What do you think the chances are that four years from tonight we'll be talking about the two of you in this contest? Senator Hart? Well, I think it's, uh, it's totally inappropriate to be discussing four years from now tonight. I think, first of all, Walter Mondale waged a, a very decent and courageous campaign. My hat is off to him. I worked hard on his behalf, and and I'm very proud of, uh, of his race and the kind of candidate that he was. 
our party has a bright future. Uh, I don't think it's uh, profitable at this point to narrow it down to individuals. I think there are going to be a lot of people coming forward as leaders of our party. And I strongly disagree with uh, Congressman Kemp. When the bill comes in for this election year recovery in terms of the $200 billion deficits and a trillion dollars for Star Wars, uh, I don't think we're going to see a recovery in the second half of the 80s. So, uh, Jack Kemp, are you going to run for president in four years? Well, I do agree with Gary on one thing he said tonight. Uh, this is not an appropriate time. Uh, this is uh, time for him to praise uh, Walter Mondale, and it's time for me, uh, certainly, to give credit to a president and the vice president who waged a tremendous campaign and have really captured the heart and mind of, of a majority of the American people. And I don't, I don't want to rest until we capture the District of Columbia. That's how I feel. Thank you both very much. Jack Kemp and uh, Senator Gary Hart. Modesty suits you both very well. By the way, in uh, Geraldine Ferraro's congressional district in New York tonight, President Reagan running ahead of Walter Mondale by a margin of 60 to 40. We'll be back with more on election 1984 right after this. It's uh, coming up in 1020 now in the east, and we can add another western state to the column for Ronald Reagan tonight as he continues to sweep across the country with a very impressive both uh, popular vote total and electoral college total. The state of Montana now, NBC News projecting Ronald Reagan, the winner in the state of Montana. This is the fifth presidential election in a year in, uh, in a row that Montana has gone with the Republican, even though it does have a Democratic governor. In the electoral college total, this is how it adds up at this time. Walter Mondale trailing with only three electoral college votes but look at this for president reagan now president reagan with 414 electoral college votes well past the 270 that he required for re-election tonight uh, we're now over 30 percent of the national precincts reporting in at this time and the spread remains 18 points 18 points for reagan and bush over mondale and ferraro still the big states of washington oregon and california yet to come in tonight so that could have a significant effect on all of that um, Roger Mudd is keeping track of the congressional and the Senate races tonight, and I think that he has some fresh information for us and all that. Not that you haven't had fresh information all night long, Roger. There is a real, real fight going on in Illinois. That's uh, Percy and Simon, and the, uh, the popular vote indicates that, uh, that Simon is doing uh, quite well in Chicago and Cook County, as you would expect, and in the southern part of the state where he's from. He uh, is leading Charles Percy 53% uh, to 46% with uh, a little less than a third of the precincts in. Percy is uh, doing quite well in the, the suburbs in the northwest part and in Nebraska. This is a major coattail state for Reagan. Uh, the Democratic incumbent, Jim Exxon, is having a, a, a real struggle with Nancy Hoke, who uh, does not have much experience as a politician, and she is putting up a fight in all parts of the state, in Nebraska, and she's held, even in Democratic Omaha, she has held uh, uh, Governor, uh, uh, Senator Exxon to less than eight points. And there are uh, three big Democrats uh, in the House of Representatives that the Republicans have taken aim at, number one. James Jones in the 1st District of Oklahoma, Tulsa. He is dividing uh, his vote about 50-50 with Frank Keating in the 1st District of Oklahoma. James Jones in trouble in Oklahoma. In the 2nd District of Maryland, Clarence Long going for his 12th term in trouble with Helen Bentley, dividing 50-50. And in the 12th District of New Jersey, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, District of New Jersey, Joseph Minish going for his 12th term uh, losing badly to Dean Gallo. Tom? So, the shape of the House of Representatives yet to come tonight, but uh, it looks like the Republicans are picking up some seats. That's where the election stands at this time. The Soviet port that then the freighter to which these, uh, to which these crates were loaded left that Black Sea Soviet port on October 2nd, that it went through the Bosphorus on October 4th, that then, frankly, intelligence sources lost track of it when it left the Mediterranean until that same freighter showed up on the west coast of, set of South America. President Reagan, we are told, is being notified at the party that he arrived at about one hour ago here in Los Angeles, a private one, party. Two, He's being no three, notified of this Soviet one, challenge two, to him on the eve of his apparent re-election victory. One, two, Obviously, this 
is something that the president is going to have to deal with almost immediately. As you heard Chris Wallace report earlier, he had said during a brief interview while he was watching the election returns that one of the things that he most, was most interested in doing was in repairing relationships with the Soviet Union. But he said that he was not, uh, it was not up to him to make the first offer on arms control, that was, that it was up to the Soviets since they left the table. Now it appears that, as some specialists had been uh, anticipating, the Soviets are preparing to challenge the administration in Central America, not on the arms control issue. Tom? Thank you, Andrew. Do we have any sense that the president is about to take some kind of an action, or has he instructed his intelligence community or the State Department to uh, instigate any diplomatic moves? Has he been in touch with the Soviet Union at all? Not at this time. In fact, the president is only being notified within the hour. The intelligence community and the State Department has been alerted, but uh, it is uh, far too soon for them to have decided on any steps to take. And in fact, uh, given all of the other problems and, and uh, distractions tonight, it is going to be, I think, some time before here in Los Angeles the president comes to grip with, grips with us uh, at a private dinner party uh, on the West Coast. Thanks very much. Andrea Mitchell tonight in Los Angeles. And of course, this story follows right on the heels of a report that we had on Nightly News tonight from Fred Francis at the Pentagon that Nicaragua was also about to receive a shipment of some very sophisticated Soviet helicopter gunships, some of the most lethal weapons that the Soviets could export to a country like Nicaragua. They could be a great help in the Sandinista fight against the so-called Contras, the rebels who are trying to topple the Sandinista government with the help of the United States. Marvin Kelb has been monitoring all of this, and he's at the State Department, as you can see tonight. Marvin, what are you hearing there? Uh, not just about this specific incident with the MiG-21s arriving in Nicaragua, but about plans that the Reagan administration may have for the Sandinistas and Nicaragua and for the Contras in Nicaragua in a second term. Well, unfortunately, we have some audio difficulty developing uh, with Marvin Kalb at the State Department there. We should have that repaired momentarily, and uh, we'll get back to him as quickly as we can. Before we do that, if we can, John Chancellor and I were just talking here a few moments ago. We had a tough speech today from Andre Gromyko, the Soviet foreign minister. You did. That followed a speech by Chernenko, the, the president of the Soviet Union. Chernenko, yes, it was very tough. What I find interesting about this, and perhaps it's too technical, Tom, is that if the Soviets had decided to make a bold stroke, uh, by uh, having the planes or the part, parts of the planes arrive on the night that Reagan is enjoying his victory, it's pretty hard to get a ship in there all the way from the Black Sea to coincide with this. So that either this is a longer range Soviet strategy that they're following, that they'd embarked on last October, or the timing of it comes from American intelligence sources who would want to put it out tonight for whatever reasons I can't imagine. Yeah, it is hard to know. As, of course, the Sandinistas just had their own election on Sunday, an election that the administration quickly called a hoax. That's right. The Sandinistas were overwhelmingly re-elected to their positions, or elected in the, in the first order, and they have been predicting all along that the United States was planning some kind of an invasion of Nicaragua, an invasion that has not yet occurred if it were ever to occur. Well, some uh, news of the international sort tonight. We'll be back with more after this. Well, as we were saying a few moments ago, the president was told tonight that the Soviet Union has shipped anywhere from 12 to 18 MiG-21s to Nicaragua. He was told that tonight as he was celebrating an election victory of landslide proportions, both in the popular vote and in the uh, Electoral College vote in California. We uh, asked Marvin Kalb about any plans that the State Department had in a second Reagan term for Nicaragua generally, and specifically about the arrival of these sophisticated new weapons in that tiny country. And unfortunately, we had some audio difficulty. I'm told now that that has been repaired. And Marvin, it's always good to hear from you. Right. Well, Tom, I, what I am hearing here from an informed official is that U.S. intelligence has been tracking this ship for quite a bit of time now. There may be, there may be a dozen high-performance aircraft on that freighter. This is not anything that can happen overnight. This is a long-term, or it has to be, a long-term Soviet strategy to try to build up the Nicaraguan forces. They intend to do that whether or not the election is taking place. I think it would be a blunder to try to link one with the other. 
Uh, Marvin, what about generally the, uh, the policy of this administration in Central America in a second term? The president tonight is getting, as you can see in the map behind us and everything that we've been saying, a real mandate. I mean, it's an endorsement of his policies. He didn't back away from his Central American policies in the course of the campaign. Anything activist in mind, or are they going to be more peace-seeking this time? Uh, well, I think that one of the things guys. that comes through is that the administration keeps on talking about the effort to pursue a peaceful settlement in Central America. But what I have been hearing now for at least three or four weeks is that once the election is over, and I believe that the people who told me this probably knew that there was some movement of Soviet military supplies into Nicaragua or that the supplies were coming. These officials have told me that we are going to pursue what they call a more muscular foreign policy in Central America. What do you mean by muscular? They mean a more military-oriented policy. They do not intend, as one of them put it, to live with an expansionist Sandinista regime in Nicaragua. Now, if the president has the kind of mandate that appears to be obvious from that map behind you, then it is clear that he will be able to go to the Congress and probably get its approval for further action of a more muscular nature in Central America. This is going to run directly counter to the overriding, overarching policy that he is trying to pursue with the Soviet Union. He has said over and over again that he wants to get an arms control agreement with the Soviet Union. The Secretary of State has said that linkage no longer applies. You don't have to have everything going in the same direction. But clearly, if the Russians are challenging him in his own backyard, it is going to be extraordinarily difficult for him to pursue an effort at arms control with the Soviet Union. Thanks very much, Marvin Cal with the State Department tonight. John Chancellor was just looking at the calendar a little bit. That ship reportedly left the Black Sea around October 2nd, and it was around that same time, not too far away from that, that the Soviet Foreign Minister, Andrei Gromyko, was visiting with President Reagan. Marvin, do you remember the date? I think he's gone I think we've now. lost him. Right, but, but, but it's possible that Gromyko knew that that shipment was on the way and sat in the White House uh, eating his uh, asparagus. Well, I don't know that he knew that the shipment was on the way, John, but we both remember in 1962 when Gromyko sat there with President Kennedy at the time of the Cuban missiles, and the president knew that the missiles were on the way. He tested Gromyko, and Gromyko did not say anything. Whether Gromyko knew about the MiG-21s arriving in Nicaragua, I do not know at this point. Thank you very much, Marvin Kelvin, John Chancellor. We have some more states that we want to project now for President Reagan. And uh, they're dwindling down to a precious few opportunities for Walter Mondale at this time. The state of Rhode Island, which is one of the states the Democrats thought that they had a shot at. Rhode Island tonight we project for Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, the tiny state by the sea. Rhode Island for Ronald Reagan. It is a little corner of blue up there. Massachusetts still could go for Walter Mondale, of course. We'll be keeping our eye on that. Also, out in the Midwest, a state that uh, Walter Mondale felt a real kinship with, but it's a state in which uh, Ronald Dutch Reagan began to rise to fame as a broadcaster on station WHO. Iowa tonight, the projected winner, Ronald Reagan in Iowa. Also in Idaho, his second best state four years ago tonight, projected winner in Idaho with its four electoral votes is uh, President Reagan. So he begins to add to his total Massachusetts still outstanding, and Minnesota up there, a little white island where Walter Mondale is tonight. Let's take a look at the Electoral College vote. 270 required. President Reagan is uh, maybe be, may be able to double it. Well, he can't double that, obviously, but he's got 430 electoral votes at this time. Walter Mondale, three. So it's a commanding, a landslide for uh, President Reagan in the Electoral College vote. And if his popular vote holds, it will be a landslide for him there as well. He conceivably could win all 50 states, losing only the District of Columbia, but still we have other states outstanding. Walter Mondale holding on and hoping for Minnesota, Massachusetts, and maybe even one of the western states. Polls still open out there. Opportunity to vote remains. We'll be back with more after this. Roger Mudd has been just as busy as he can be over there, keeping track of those 435 House seats that are up for election tonight and the 33 Senate races. You got some uh, projections for us in the Senate, Roger? Tom, the number of uh, un unsettled Senate races is getting smaller and smaller. We have uh, some quick projections for you in Iowa. This is a critical race for the Democrats, and tonight we project the, the new senator from Iowa is Tom Harkin. He's a former congressman, and he has defeated 
the Republican incumbent Roger Jepson, who was uh, in for just one term. Uh, in Montana, the uh, Democratic incumbent Max Baucus has been reelected to his second term, defeating Chuck Cousins. And in Idaho, the Republican incumbent James McClure reelected to his third term, defeating the Democrat Pete Bush. Mr. McClure is the chairman of the Senate Energy Committee. So with those three uh, elections, let's take a look at the new Senate and how it shapes up. This is the way the new Senate appears at this moment. 51 Republican seats, 43 Democratic seats, and left to be decided are six seats. That's the way the new Senate looks uh, to date. Six seats still to be decided. Some of the undecided uh, Senate races, uh, uh, among them is Michigan, where the Democratic incumbent Carl Levin going for his second term against Jack Lausma. That's a close race, made close by the Reagan coattails. Look at the popular vote. And we caution you that uh, in this popular vote count, the city of Detroit is not yet in, so the popular vote shows Mr. Lausma ahead of uh, Senator Levin. But when Detroit comes in a heavily Democratic uh, uh, vote, you will find that race tightening up. So with 13% of the precincts in, Lausma leading 53% to 47%. That's Michigan. So left to be decided would be, uh, Tom, Alaska, Michigan, Illinois, Nebraska, and Oregon. The Democrats to date have picked up one seat. If the trend continues in Illinois and Simon uh, takes that seat from the Republicans, that's a net pickup of two seats for the Democrats. They had hoped for a little more, but that's not bad. No. It's also a big scramble on the Republican side because Chuck Percy was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and if he were to lose that post, it would probably go to a far more conservative person. Like Jesse Helms. Like Jesse Helms, possibly. I, I wonder whether the pressure, will, the Republican Party pressure, will be on Helms to stay over in agriculture. Yeah. Well, he has made the pledge down in North Carolina that that's where he'd stay, of course, because it's important to the tobacco industry. It was also important, important to his re-election that North Carolina believed he was going to stay on agriculture. Right. Roger, we've been watching uh, the vote very carefully in Massachusetts tonight. Walter Mondale looking for some victories wherever he can find them. And so far, he has only the District of Columbia. So take a look now at what's going on in Massachusetts tonight. It is one of the uh, most democratic states in the country, of course. It's the one state that went for George McGovern in 72. 40% of the precincts are in in Massachusetts, the home of Teddy Kennedy, the home of Speaker O'Neill, the home of Governor Michael Dukakis, and tonight, with 40% of those precincts in, you can see that Mondale and Ferraro had a lead over President Reagan of about nine points. So we'll be watching Massachusetts. We, uh, as yet, cannot project a winner there, either Reagan or Mondale in Massachusetts. However, let us tell you that Massachusetts is a state of a, a changing electorate. A lot of people up there now are in uh, white-collar businesses. They used to, it used to be a big manufacturing state for the shoe business and textiles and so on. Now they do a lot of uh, software manufacturing, computer-related business. And there's a place called the Erie Pub, which is a blue-collar hangout. You, it may sound familiar to you. It's in Dorchester, Massachusetts, because that's where President Reagan stopped by just to have a Valentine's one day and raise a few with the boys uh, when he was out trying to appeal to the blue-collar voters. Well, Fred Briggs finds himself tonight, uh, fortunately, at the Erie Pub in Dorchester, Pennsylvania, with, uh, uh, Massachusetts, with some of the people who hang out there. Fred? Yes, indeed. We're here at the Erie Pub, and uh, this area of Dorchester, by the way, whatever Massachusetts finally does tonight, that to go for Reagan by about 51% uh, to 49%. So you would have to call this part of the neighborhood Reagan territory definitely. Now, I have here with me a gentleman by the name of Tom Cummings, who is a Democrat, a self-described Democrat, lifelong Democrat. So who did you vote for for president? Well, I voted for Reagan. I've been a Democrat all my life, but I think I feel more comfortable with Reagan as president for the next four years. I think no matter who is elected tonight, we'll have a difficult time. But I, as a Democrat and an American, will feel more comfortable with Reagan in the White House. But you still describe yourself as a Democrat? Oh, I will live, I will die a Democrat. Oh yeah, I will die a Democrat and live a Democrat, but I have to think once in a while. Fair enough. On my uh, right here, we have uh, State Representative Paul White, who is a Democrat, who is uh, wearing, I believe, a Mondale Ferraro button, among other things right here, and who has had, uh, well, 12 years in the, uh, in the legislature here. You're a Democrat. What's going wrong with your party here? Well, I think the Democratic Party has lost touch with its base. I think there's no question that the Democratic Party has to go back to the principles and the values 
that have generally uh, promoted the coalition that has traditionally elected Democrats to the presidency of the United States. I think tonight is a valuable lesson in that regard, and I'm hopeful that four years from now, we'll see a nominee who can carry forward the values of working class people that uh, frequent a place like this, and they can comfortably vote for a Democrat. Well, now, you did apparently elect the senator. We have John Kerry, the winner of the Senate here. Mm -hmm. It still seems to be a toss-up last I uh, heard. We have not projected which way in Massachusetts. Do you think Massachusetts could be another repeat of the McGovern year, 72? I think there's a good likelihood that Massachusetts may squeak out a victory for Mondale. I think part of that is the general uh, independence of this state. I think the tradition of electing people who espouse the uh, traditional democratic values. Is it the liberalism of this state? It's no the liberalism of this state. It's not strictly the liberalism. It's uh, it's the traditional values, and I think that's what the Democratic Party has to go back to. Well, we're still waiting to hear uh, how it's going to come out. It seems to be neck and neck. Tom? Thanks very much. Fred Briggs at the Erie Pub tonight. That's in Dorchester, Massachusetts, and I had the numbers wrong going in as well. I said that it was only a, it was a nine-point lead for Mondale. He's leading by only two points at this time, with 40% of the precincts reporting in in Massachusetts. Uh, we can now project another state for Ronald Reagan, right next to his home state, the state of Nevada. No big surprise here. That's one of the strongest states that he had in his election lineup. So Nevada goes blue as the West begins to fill in, as the South, the Midwest, and the Northeast began to fill in for Ronald Reagan as well. The state of Nevada now for uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, it is the home state of Paul Laxalt, who is the general chairman of his campaign. 434 electoral votes for the president. It's free for Walter Mondale. And we take a quick look at the election. Well, I guess we can't. We don't need to. You can see what's going on there. A big lead for Ronald Reagan in the electoral college and about an 18-point lead in the popular vote. So that's where the election stands at this time. Pause and raise the question about whether, in fact, that time hasn't gone by. Tonight, the people are making a judgment about that. Well, he spent two years uh, after the last defeat with President Carter just convincing himself that he was ready to be president. And now he says he is, be, is ready. And they're clearly stunned by what happened here this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. A few minutes ago, I called the President of the United States and congratulated him on his victory for re-election as President of the United States. Please. He has won. We are all Americans. He is our President, and we honor him tonight. Again tonight, the American people in town halls, in homes, in firehouses, in libraries, chose the occupant of the most powerful office on earth. Their choice was made peacefully, with dignity, and with majesty. And although, and although I would have rather won Tonight, tonight, tonight we rejoice in our democracy. We rejoice in the freedom of a wonderful people, and we accept their verdict. I thank, I thank the people of America for hearing my case. I have traveled this nation, I believe, more than any living American. And wherever, and wherever, and wherever I've gone, the American people have heard me out. They've listened to me. They've treated me fairly. They've lifted my spirits, and they've added to my strength. And if there's one thing I'm certain of, it is that this is a magnificent nation with the finest people on earth. I thank, I thank, 
I thank above all my family. How lucky, how lucky I am. Joan has campaigned with class all over this nation. Where, where are you? And we're very, we're very, very proud of our kids, Ted and Elder Jane and William. Everywhere they went, they got us support. And I thank Geraldine Ferraro. We're very proud of Jerry. We're very proud of Jerry. We didn't, we didn't win, but we made history, and that fight has just begun. And once again, here I am in Minnesota. In over 24 years, never once have the people of Minnesota turned me down, including tonight. Minnesotans, this is a this is a special state, a remarkable state with a special spirit. And time and time again in the past, Minnesota has led the way for our nation. And I think you did it again tonight. And I want to especially thank my staff, Jim Johnson and the whole crew, my workers and my volunteers all over this country. What a special, what a special group of Americans they are. I know what you sacrificed for me and for my country. And I want to say a special word to my young supporters this evening. I know I know how you feel because I've been there myself. Do not, do not despair. This fight didn't end tonight. It begins tonight. I have been around, I've been around for a while and I have noticed in the seeds of most all, every victory are to be found the seeds of defeat, and in every defeat are to be found the seeds of victory. Let us fight on, let us fight on. My loss tonight does not in any way diminish the worth or the importance of our struggle. The, Amer the America we want to build is just as important tomorrow as it was yesterday. Let us continue, let us continue to seek an America that is just and fair. Tonight, tonight especially, I think of the poor, the unemployed, the elderly, the handicapped, the helpless, and the sad, and they need us more than ever tonight. Let us fight for jobs and fairness. Let us fight for these kids and make certain they have the best education that any generation ever had. Let us, let us fight 
for our environment and protect our air, our water, and our land. And while we met, keep America strong, let's use that strength to keep the peace, to reflect our values, and to control these weapons before they destroy us all. That has been my fight. That has been our fight in this campaign. And we must fight for those goals with all of our heart in the future. I am honored, I am honored by Minnesota, by all the people of this country that have permitted me to wage this fight. What an honor it is. And I'm at, and I'm at peace with the knowledge that I gave it everything I've got. confident that history will judge us honorably. So tonight, let us be determined to fight on. Good night, and God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Walt we now rejoin NBC's coverage of the 1984 presidential election. Now, 16 points over Mondale and Ferraro, a 16-point lead, 58 to 42. For a time, it was as high as 20, 21. If it stays at uh, that number, it still is a commanding, even landslide victory, but it may drop down a little bit. We'll have to watch this evening go along. So that's the national vote. Those two states that I talked about that we have not been able to make a call in yet because it's still too close for us to make the kind of projection that we would like to, let us begin in the state of Massachusetts, if we can up in the northeastern part of the United States, show you the popular vote in Massachusetts tonight. Well, maybe we, there we can. 61% of the precincts reporting in. Massachusetts did elect a Democrat tonight as a senator, but we have virtually a dead heat in the presidential race. Just a few thousand votes separating the two tickets. As you can see, it's about, what, 11,000 votes altogether out of over 1,300,000 cast. In Massachusetts four years ago, Ronald Reagan was able to win, but it is a state with Ted Kennedy and Speaker O'Neill and a strongly Democratic uh, House delegation as well. Minnesota now, 21% of the precincts are in. Mondale and Ferraro with the lead, as you can see there, of 16 points. But because of the way the votes are coming in, we cannot yet make a projection. We'll have to see a broader pattern of votes from certain key precincts before we can tell you what we think will likely happen tonight in Walter Mondale state of Minnesota. In any event, this has been a very big night for the man that a lot of politicians refuse to take seriously throughout much of his career, and that is Ronald Reagan, elected first governor of California in 1966 after he made a fundraising speech in the Barry Goldwater debacle of 20 years ago. That's when Ronald Reagan was first really noticed by a lot of the heavyweights in the Republican Party, when on the eve of that election, in which the Republicans lost that time, as the Democrats are tonight, Ronald Reagan made a speech commanded a lot of attention, two years later ran for governor of California, was re-elected, and then began his run for the presidency in earnest, even though he had made one shot at it in 1968, and was elected four years ago. Tonight, the era of Reagan continues nationwide. And Roger Mudd has been taking a look at the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. Particularly the Senate. It's winding down, Tom. Not more than two or three left uh, that are not decided. Uh, let's take a look quickly at Oregon. We have a projected winner in Oregon, Mark Hatfield, reelected tonight to his fourth term. And in Nebraska, Democratic incumbent James Exxon, reelected to his second term. So those uh, leave us only Alaska and Illinois with the election of uh, Hatfield and Exxon. Now, let's run through the whole list. See who's, uh, who are the new winners, who's coming to Washington in the United States Senate, beginning with Alabama. Howell Heflin, Democrat. Arkansas. David Pryor, Democrat. Colorado. William Armstrong, Republican, second term. Delaware. Joseph Biden, Democrat, third term. Georgia. 
Sam Nunn, Democrat, third term. Idaho, James McClure, Republican, third term. Iowa, freshman, Democrat, Tom Harkin. Kansas, Nancy Kassebaum, Republican, second term. Kentucky, freshman, Republican, Mitch McConnell. An upset, Maine, William Cohen, Republican, second term. Massachusetts, Democrat, John Kerry, freshman. Michigan, Carl Levin, Democrat, second term. Minnesota, Boschwitz, Republican, second term. Mississippi, Cochran, Republican, second term. Montana, Democrat. Max Baucus, re-elected, second term. New Hampshire, Republican, Gordon Humphrey, second term. New Jersey, Democrat, Bill Bradley, second term. New Mexico, Pete Domenici, Republican, second term. North Carolina, Jesse Helms, Republican. In North Carolina, Jesse Helms, re-elected tonight to his third term. In Oklahoma, David Boren, Democrat, second term. Rhode Island, there's David Boren, former governor, re-elected, second term. In Rhode Island, Democrat, Claiborne Pell, fifth term. In South Carolina, Strom Thurmond, fifth term. South Dakota, Republican, Pressler, second term. Tennessee, freshman, Democrat, Albert Gore, Jr. Texas, freshman, Republican, Philip Graham. Virginia, Republican, Warner, second term. West Virginia, Democrat, freshman, Rockefeller. And Wyoming, Alan Simpson, Republican, second term. There's the list, Tom. Two are left, Alaska and Illinois. Okay, Roger, we're going to go now to Queens, the borough of Queens, New York, where tonight we're, we're in Manhattan, I'm told. We've just changed boroughs from Queens to Manhattan. Geraldine Ferraro, Democratic vice presidential candidate, the first woman to run for that office tonight, in the major party ticket. Campaign in. The race is over. This is not a moment for partisan statements. It is a moment to celebrate our democracy and to think of our country. The American people have put their trust in President Reagan. And in the interest and in the interest of the nation with hope for the future, I ask all Americans to join together, work together, and pledge our support for our president in the search of, for a more just society, a strong America, and a world at peace. Tonight, tonight I would also I would also like to thank my running mate and my friend, Walter Mondale. <laughs> For more than two decades, he has forsaken personal gain to promote the public good. He has fought for people who need our help. He has stood up for every decent cause in the last 25 years. <laughs> and even though he did not win this race for the presidency, in 1984, he waged another battle, a battle for equal opportunity, and that battle Walter Mondale won. Two centuries, candidates have run for president. Not one from a major party ever asked a woman to be his running mate until Walter Mondale. When he asked me to be campaigned by his side, he opened a door which will never be closed again. That is a victory of which every American can be proud. Campaigns, even if you lose them, do serve a purpose. 
My candidacy has said the days of discrimination are numbered. American women will never again be second-class <laughs> citizens. <laughs> Elections also focus the nation's attention on the things that truly matter. In this campaign, Americans have all been made more aware of the danger of the nuclear arms race. We have all recognized the needs of our changing economy. We have all been reminded of the millions of Americans who have been counted out before their talents have been added up, and we can all take pride in those accomplishments. We live in a time of exciting change. This country built the space shuttle, the most sophisticated machine ever to fly, and a black and a woman, woman were among the first to fly in it. From Argentina to the Philippines, there's a new awakening of freedom. And all over the world, people are calling for the opportunity to choose their own destinies. I think America can be the vanguard of change. I have faith in the American people, and I believe in this country. Our society is the fairest on earth, but we can work even harder for fairness. Our nation is at peace, but we can do even more to reduce the risk of war. America is a great nation. America is a great nation, but if there's one thing that our campaign has stood for, it is that our country can be even greater. <laughs> that cause, our country's cause, is never finished, and I, for one, will continue to work for it. Tonight brings an end to a long campaign. This is a moment to rejoice in our democracy. It is also a moment for us to be proud. All of us can go to sleep tonight confident that we did everything we could to win this election. So let me say to our supporters throughout the country, to my staff, my family, and my friends, we fought hard. We gave it our best, and we made a difference. what we have done. I am. And I thank you very, very much. Geraldine Ferraro, this campaign was both a triumph and a trial by fire for her. The first woman to run as a vice presidential candidate on a major ticket. She brought a lot of spunk and spirit wherever she went, but at the same time, she had some very difficult questions to answer, of course, about her husband's financial dealings. She's now uh, Bella Abzug that she was saying hello to there and some other New York political figures as she makes her way out of the hall. And there is uh, there are continuing reports that uh, after a period of time has passed, that her husband may have some even more difficult legal questions to answer from New York State authorities. Ferraro is interested in the uh, Senate race in 1986 from New York against Alphonse D'Amato, who is the uh, Republican senator up for election in the state in two years. Bob Kerr is at uh, her headquarters tonight. Bob, can you hear me? Well, he may be, uh, not be able to hear us because of the noise. This is in Manhattan. She was an Italian Catholic woman from Queens. And the Mondale people obviously hope that uh, 
all of those parts of her personality would help him as well. What happened in New York, Ronald Reagan carried 58% of the Catholics, Walter Mondale 42%, and Ronald Reagan carried 63% of the Italians in this state, Walter Mondale 37%. So there wasn't a big draw there. Geraldine Ferraro, it's a campaign that will linger in the memory of a lot of people for a long time, especially when she uh, accepted the nomination in San Francisco, you recall, at the Democratic Convention there. A lot of women in that audience that night there were uh, very moist-eyed, and a lot of women across the country uh, were very taken with the idea that a woman could run for vice president. The Democrats had hoped against hope that there might be a kind of secret woman's vote that would be exercised today. Women would uh, say to pollsters, yes, I'm going to vote for Ronald Reagan in the presence of their husband, and then go off and the privacy of the voting booth, they would cast the ballot for Walter Mondale and Geraldine Ferraro because, in fact, she was a woman running for president, uh, vice president of the United States. At any rate, we'll be hearing more from Geraldine Ferraro. She had to give up her House seat. She was a popular and increasingly powerful member of the House of Representatives, but I think that uh, it's a very good possibility that she'll be running for office once again, perhaps for the Senate from New York at any event. We'll be back with more from election night, 1984, after this. Decision 84 election night continues. Sponsored by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? And by AT&T. We're reaching out in new directions. Now from the NBC News Election Center in New York, here is Tom Brokaw. Good evening. I'm here with John Chancellor and Roger Mudd. And the map behind me tells the story from sea to shining sea, with the exception of Minnesota and Massachusetts and the District of Columbia. It is Ronald Reagan country tonight in this presidential contest. The people who work with him are already talking about a mandate. Well, we'll have to wait and see on that because we don't know the shape of the Congress finally. 57% of the precincts nationwide have been counted now. And as you can see, the president has a lead of 18 points. Vice President Bush and President Reagan leading Mondale and Ferraro by 18 points with more than half of the precincts having been counted nationwide. That adds up to an electoral college landslide tonight, as well as a popular landslide if it stays at that. We can already tell you what's happened in the electoral college. It's going to be enormous. 270 required. The president has 505 electoral college votes at this time. Here are some other electoral college landslides from history. John Chancellor pointed out to us a few moments ago that Alf Landon got eight votes when he ran against FDR for his uh, second term in 1936. Franklin Roosevelt, he ended up with 523 electoral votes, and Alf Landon received only eight. In 1964, it was Lyndon Johnson against Barry Goldwater, another landslide win. Goldwater ending up with uh, 52 electoral votes. 1972, Richard Nixon and George McGovern. George McGovern getting 17 electoral votes, those from the District of Columbia and the state of Massachusetts. His only victories on that night, Richard Nixon, 520. Four years ago, Ronald Reagan won an Electoral College landslide. He received 489 that night. Jimmy Carter won six states and 49 electoral votes. It seems unlikely tonight that uh, Walter Mondale will do that well. In fact, he cannot. If he wins uh, Minnesota and Massachusetts, he cannot get up to the Carter total of four years ago. So that's where that stands. It's a, an enormous win for President Reagan tonight. 70% of the precincts have now been counted in Massachusetts. As you can see, we have virtually a dead heat there, about 5,000 votes separating them out of a million fi uh, 500,000 that have been cast so far. And in Mondale's home state of Minnesota, more than a quarter of the precincts have been counted. Mondale counting on a win in his home state. He said the state has never turned him down, and he doesn't expect it to tonight. He now has a lead there, as you can see, of 57-43 over the ticket of Ronald Reagan and... Uh, George Bush. The president went into Minnesota in the final hours of the campaign, stopping off in Rochester, Minnesota on Saturday and held a, even a mini news conference. Some people thought that the Gipper was trying to run up the score, as they put it, and he said, no, the Gipper just believes in playing until the final bell has been sounded. So those are the numbers, and they are impressive for President Reagan tonight at this hour, as he has now won virtually every state. We still have Alaska and Hawaii and Minnesota and Massachusetts outstanding. We'll have to wait and see what happens with them. Roger, do you have some uh, 
congressional races and results for us? Well, I've, I, we ought to just check in with the one one holding uh, Senate race, and that's Illinois, a very critical one uh, for the Republican Party. Let's take a look at uh, Illinois' popular vote, 56 of, uh, percent of those precincts in, and Paul Simon, the Democrat, the downstate congressman, holding on to a 53 percent, 46 percent lead over Charles Percy. This is the first time Senator Percy has faced uh, a downstate Democrat, and that has uh, upset the normal base of power that Senator Percy employs because uh, not only does the Democrat pick up strength around Chicago and Cook County from the machine, but he also gets the downstate vote from the Democrats. For instance, Paul Simon is running uh, 33 points ahead of Charles Percy in Chicago and Cook County and 10, percent point, 10 percentage points ahead in the South. Senator Percy is uh, leading Simon in the suburbs by 16 percent and in the northwest part of the state by 11. So with uh, that many precincts in, Paul Simon is maintaining his lead. That's a very critical race, and, and the outcome will, will uh, determine who takes over the new uh, chairmanship of the uh, Foreign Relations Committee. So let's take a look at how the United States Senate will look in uh, 1985, the new composition of the Senate. 52 Republican seats, 45 Democratic seats, to be decided three to be decided three. So we would have a pickup possibly of uh, two Democratic seats. Let's take a look now at the composition of the new House of Representatives in the 99th Congress. The new House, 250 Democratic seats, 185 Republican seats, and that's a rough cut, a rough look at the new House, and that's a Republican pickup of 17 seats. That was our estimate several hours ago, Tom that may drop. There are indications that the Republicans will not pick up all 17, but uh, we're still waiting for a more careful and refined look at that. But in any event, uh, the Democrats uh, got uh, the minimum of what they hoped, I think, probably one or two seats. I think that's the best they'll get. And the Republicans didn't get as much as they'd hoped. They hold, if they hold them to 17, that will be a pretty big victory for the Democrats tonight, because they were really sweating out whether they would go 20, 25. As, for a time, some of the people in the Reagan campaign were talking about a 30-seat win in the House of Representatives. And, and with the proportions of this landslide, you would have thought, I mean, I was prepared to uh, uh, not to be very shocked by a 25 or 30 point uh, seat pickup by the Republicans. Roger, what happens though when a member of the House of Representatives gets back to Washington elected as a Democrat, maybe even a mainstream moderate Democrat, and looks at what has happened in the rest of the country? Does he or she take a dive and uh, have to go along with the president's uh, program? Well, uh, they do what they did back in 1981 when Ronald Reagan came in with, with a major landslide. They, uh, they trim their sails. They, you know, they, they sign on to the balanced budget amendment. They sign on to the school well, prayer amendment. That they may do that right. Are you predicting they may do that this time? I'm not predicting that, that they would do that this time with an open White House coming up. I don't think they will <laughs> with an open White House yeah. coming and with a lame duck president and without large numbers but that just, were brought in by yeah. Reagan. But just remember, House members are up again in two years. Now let me tell you about some small numbers. Look what's going on in the state of Vermont tonight. This is a real race right to the wire. We have almost three-fourths of the precincts reporting in and we have 202 votes separating the candidates for governor, John Easton, who's the attorney general there, and Madeline Coonan, who is the running to become the first woman governor of Vermont in that state's history. 202 votes. It is virtually a dead heat. We probably will not be able to project in Verm Vermont before the end of the evening, but we'll certainly keep you posted on that race. And we'll have more on election night, 1984, from NBC News election headquarters right after this. One of the groups that cannot be feeling too good about what has happened in this uh, election tonight, besides members of the Walter Mondale family, both the personal family and the official campaign family, are black people in America. They uh, were overwhelmingly in favor of, of Walter Mondale. Uh, the blacks have been suffering particularly during the Reagan administration. We've had more of them drop below the poverty line, high rates of unemployment for the past four years. What do our polls show tonight, John, about black well, voters and what they have to say about all this? You know, it's the country's largest minority group. They con constitute about 12 percent of the population. Mm -hmm. And what we see is uh, what could tr easily translate into a lot of anger. Uh, the blacks are giving 9 percent of their vote to Ronald Reagan as of now, as opposed to about 7 percent four years ago. But when we asked uh, the general population today, are you better off now than you were four years ago, 48 percent of the whites 
said they are better off than they were, and that's a very important component. But look at the blacks. Only 11% said that they're better off now. Most voters today accepted the argument that the Reagan policies helped the economic recovery. And when we put that question to the uh, voters, 58% of the whites said yes, the Reagan policy did help it, but only 12% of the blacks expressed any confidence that the Reagan policy helped the economy. And what we find is a great division of opinion on the fairness of the Reagan administration. Again, a poll question. Is the, Reagan, will the, is the Reagan administration fair to the poor and to other groups? We found today that 50% of the whites said yes, the administration is fair, and a tiny percentage, something like 7 or 8% of the blacks uh, thought that the administration was fair. So they feel worse off. They don't think the administration's policies have helped the economy. They do not judge fairness at all. What you get are you get the picture, Tom, of two American electorates, one black and one white, two entirely different views of the United States as reflected in these poll figures. When I was talking to Jesse Jackson earlier, I didn't have an opportunity to ask him the question I think that is really ultimately the most important one. What can the blacks do to make some kind of an accommodation with the Reagan administration to get their case across, to make some kind of a political deal so that they don't feel that they are, in fact, left only at the bottom of the barrel for the next four years. Something is going to have to be done. I, I don't, don't know whether anything Tom, can be done. I don't know how you do that because I'm not saying that the Reagan administration has a good reputation with black Americans. It doesn't. But the fact is that the goals of the second Reagan term, as we've seen them outlined here tonight, do not single out black people. They are going to see to it that social programs don't grow. The blacks are heavily dependent on social programs, along with a lot of white poor people as well. Uh, more white poor people than black poor people. More white poor people than black poor people in, in, uh, in many categories. But the fact is that I don't think the Reagan administration is anti-black. I just think that the development of American policy endorsed by the voters today in great numbers is going to make life hard for the poor people in this country, including black. Well, someone who can talk about that is in Atlanta tonight with uh, NBC News correspondent Dennis Murphy at a big NAACP get out the vote party there. And that is State Senator Julian Bond, whom I've known from my Atlanta days. Good evening. Hello, Tom. They're tearing down the bandstand here at the Civic Center. It was a good party, good music, a good crowd. There was a big get-out-the-vote uh, turnout all over the South. It's, Senator, you said you're depressed tonight. What happened to this party? Where did the, the white Southern vote go? Well, it obviously went with President Reagan. It turned its back on that section of the black population, which has provided about 20% of the vote for national Democratic candidates, and in the South, uh, a good third of the vote for the Democratic candidates who've been mayors, governors, U.S. senators, elected to public office on the Democratic ticket. This election means that black Democrats have to renegotiate their relationship with southern white Democrats. Obviously, while we've been voting for them, they've been thinking about voting for something else, and they did that tonight. A minute ago, Tom just mentioned coming to some kind of accommodation with the Reagan administration in the second term. How do you do it? How do you keep your issues alive in the second term? Well, it's difficult to do. You know, black leadership has tried to do it over the past four years, and we've been told that the Reagan administration is helping us in great measure while we've seen our infant mortality rate go up. We've seen the administration try to defeat the Voting Rights Act. We've seen them gut the Civil Rights Commission. We've seen them crush us in every possible way, and yet they tell us that we simply don't understand them. We've tried as best we can, and I use that in a large sense, to meet with them, to work with them. And generally, they said, to him, we're not interested in you, so I don't know if we can do it over the next four years. If not, we're, we're going to be in some awful bad shape. Senator, I talked to two prominent black Atlantans today who both said almost the same thing. They talked about what they felt was white selfishness, that whites had somehow abandoned blacks and black issues in the last, in the last decade. Well, not just blacks, but they've abandoned a sizable minority in white America that are really in bad shape and have been in bad shape. They've turned their back on us, and they've turned their back on them. What's going to happen, I don't know. Thank you. State Senator Julian Bond. Tom? Dennis Murphy and Julian Bond, thanks very much for being with us from Atlanta tonight. Incidentally, momentarily, or before too long at any rate, we expect to hear from President Reagan in California. He said that he would not appear tonight until the polls in California had closed, and they have now closed in California. He has certainly wrapped up this election, as you can see in the map behind me. He has won virtually all of the states that we have been able to show you, except Massachusetts, Minnesota, Hawaii, and Alaska still to come in. At any rate, we expect to hear from President Reagan. We'll have still more returns for you after this.
We're back once again during the course of this campaign as an insult. Walter Mondale called President Reagan the sunshine president. Well, the sun certainly was shining on President Reagan much more than it was on Walter Mondale on this election day. It's going to be a sizable electoral college landslide for the president and probably a, a sizable popular vote landslide for him as well. We've got some very tight races around the country, however, especially in the Senate race in Illinois tonight, and Roger Mudd has been keeping track of that. Roger? Real close out there. Well, look at it. 62% of the precincts in. Paul Simon holding on. Five-point lead over uh, Republican incumbent Charles Percy. That's a very close race, and uh, Simon's great strength is coming out of Chicago and Cook County, plus his natural strength downstate in Illinois, which was his old congressional district. At the Simon headquarters in Chicago is NBC correspondent Jim Cummins. Are you, Jim? Just fine, Roger. Give us, give us a quick one. Give us a quick briefing on what's okay. going on. Very quickly here, the crowd is building up very large and the optimism is growing just about as fast. As you said, this is a race that's going to be decided downstate. Simon is a downstate congressman, a five-term congressman. His aides say he's done better than expected in Chicago, about as well as expected in the suburbs, but much better than expected downstate so far. And that's what we're waiting for now, is those returns to come in from downstate. His aides are confident of victory. They're, they're predicting about a two-point victory for Simon right now. Uh, much more confident than they were a couple of hours ago. Back to you, Roger. Well, let me let me uh, pick up one question. Why is uh, Senator Percy uh, having such a struggle? Well, there are a couple of, uh, of reasons that are uh, suggested, at least here at Simon headquarters. One is the problems that the farmers have had in Illinois over the past uh, four years of the Reagan administration. Even though President Reagan won Illinois, a lot of the farmers downstate identified their troubles with Senator Percy. Another factor was the black vote. Senator Percy in years past has done very well in the, with the black vote in Chicago, for a Republican that is, and uh, this time it looks like Simon got more than 90 percent of that black vote. And, uh, and, and Percy's uh, de decision then to wrap himself around Reagan, to try to ride the Reagan coattails, has cost him the black vote and the liberal vote and uh, much of the Jewish vote? That's right. I think it hurt him in all of those areas. And in addition to that, he did not do as well in the Chicago suburbs as he was expected to do, Roger. And uh, one of the reasons that uh, a lot of people suggest for that is simply he's been in the Senate for 18 years and they're ready for a change. Do you remember, Jim, because you're an old Chicago hand, do you remember uh, uh, Senator Percy apologizing six years ago for being such a liberal? I certainly do. I remember him going on TV shortly before the election when the polls showed him far behind saying, I got your message, and believe me, I'll do what you tell me to do the next time. Well, this time he may be getting another message, and it may be too late. Okay, Jim, thank you. That's Jim Cummins in Chicago, Tom. Roger, we've got a roundup of some of the uh, fastest growing states in the country where Ronald Reagan has been doing very well tonight. We'll begin with the, with the national vote, first of all. Uh, as you can see, we're now approaching two-thirds of the precincts reporting in, and Ronald Reagan is uh, back to an 18-point lead over Walter Mondale. And here's what's happening in some of those states in the Sun Belt, so-called, where the population is growing at a very rapid clip. In Nevada, for example, 15% of the precincts are in. Big lead for Ronald Reagan and George Bush, uh, it, almost 50 points there. And Nevada is expected to increase its population by 140% by the year 2000. Wyoming, another big win for Ronald Reagan tonight. 61% of the precincts in, as you can see, they're a 40-point lead, about, and in Wyoming, they expect to increase their population by about 100% in the next 15, 20 years. Arizona, Arizona, nearly 20% of the precincts in, a 20-point lead for the president, and in Arizona, they expect to double their population. Florida, 80% of the precincts in in Florida, the president with a lead there of about 20 points altogether. Florida is one of the fastest growing states in the country, and so is the state of Colorado, where tonight Ronald Reagan is doing extremely well, too. So whether this is a uh, one-man race or whether it's a whole new base for the Republican Party, because the electoral votes are shifting to that part of the world, and that's good news for Republicans as they get ready to run for national office, of course. They have shifted the base from the Northeast and the South, to their part of the turf, which is the Sun Belt and the Southwest. That's where the election stands at this time. Chris Wallace is at uh, Reagan headquarters right now. Chris, they must be feeling pretty good out there. 
Well, Tom, they are indeed. As you can uh, see the scene behind me, it looks very much like the uh, Reagan rallies that we saw all this fall with uh, thousands of uh, supporters here, balloons, bunting, uh, everyone with an American flag that they're holding up. Uh, governor George Duke Majin, who was the Republican governor of California, is warming up the crowd, and we expect Ronald Reagan down here in about seven or eight minutes to uh, accept a second term as president, to uh, formally accept his victory, which he was earlier this evening when we talked to him up in his suite, he was unwilling to accept. He said he wanted to wait for it to be official. He wanted to wait for Walter Mondale to concede. But I think even he now, cautiously optimistic as he is, is going to say, yes, I've got four more years. Earlier on, Ed Rollins, who's the campaign director uh, for Reagan Bush, and I were talking, and we were watching Walter Mondale concede, and uh, he was looking at it and seeing how sad Mondale looked, and he said, you know, this is, this is very sad. It's a tough business, and even though we've been working for a long time to beat him, I take no great joy in seeing this. Uh, but then having said that, suddenly he got mad and said, I should have put more negative advertising on in the uh, state of Minnesota, he thinks he's going to lose Minnesota, that they'll only win 49 states. And he was thinking that we should have put uh, more negative advertising on in Minnesota uh, so that they could have carried that state. So on the one hand, some sense of sadness at the defeat of a fellow warrior. But on the other hand, some feeling of, gee, we should have tried harder so we could have beaten him even worse. Tom? Thanks very much, Chris Wallace at the Century Plaza Hotel tonight. And it is there that we expect to uh, that we expect to see the president very shortly. This can be a great disappointment to I think people in the Mondale campaign and to a lot of people who have lived in Massachusetts at one time or another and are ardent Democrats. NBC News now projecting that the state of Massachusetts, Ronald Reagan, the winner of the state of Massachusetts, it went with him four years ago. It goes with him once again, and the state of Massachusetts. Goes for Ronald Reagan tonight. We uh, heard some commentary that we don't necessarily need uh, in the studio here tonight. So Ronald Reagan wins the state of Massachusetts tonight. That leaves Minnesota, Alaska, and Hawaii still to come in. It was in Massachusetts that uh, Walter Mondale put on one of his most impressive rallies in the closing days of the campaign. It was there that he appeared with Speaker O'Neill and uh, Ted Kennedy, Governor Dukakis on the Boston Common with the crowd estimated anywhere from 50 to 100,000. When Mondale got to a few stops down the road, he said it was 150,000 at one point. But they could not hold the state of Massachusetts. We put that now in the Reagan column tonight, the state of Massachusetts. And that uh, the, the prospects of a 50-state sweep remain tonight for President Reagan. That's really something, John. We're going to talk about party strength and changes. We're going, to have, we're going to have to scramble the whole equation. Tonight. Well, I guess you are, and perhaps you're not, though, Tom. It's interesting. Uh, there sits Ronald Reagan tonight with 59% of the popular vote at the moment, 505 electoral votes. Does that translate into more power at the grassroots for the Republican Party? Well, we asked people today in our poll to identify themselves. In 1980, 27% of the people we interviewed identified themselves as Republican. Now let's see what happened this year. More, 32%, a five-point gain. That's not bad. That's a serious increase in, in party strength. And what happened to the Democrats while that was going on? Well, we go back first to the question we asked in 1980. 39% of the people we interviewed said they were Democrats then, and today, only 33. That's a six-point loss. What that means is that in the Reagan four years, the Democrats began them with a 12-point spread, and they ended up just about even with the Republicans. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the Republic, that the Democrats are in serious trouble around the country, they're not. As Roger Mudd has reported, they're strong and will continue to be strong in the House of Representatives controlling it. They will be strong in the U.S. Senate. They have about 60% of all the governorships in the country, the 50 state governors. They have 70% plus of all the state legislatures in the United States. And in terms of city governments, municipal governments, the Democrats control 60% of them at least. So what you have here is, Tom, you have the American people doing what they've done so many times before, hedging their bets, casting a, a presidential vote for one party, and as we see on the map back there, and then hedging the bet 
and casting a congressional or gubernatorial vote for the other party. Well, there's some very interesting ticket splitting that goes on around the country. You take a state like Kansas, it's got a Democratic governor, John, a guy who's taking on the problems of that state, and yet Kansas has been voting for Republican presidential candidates since 1936. Arizona, the same case. New Mexico, the same case. Colorado, with Dick Lamb out there as the Democratic governor, and yet Colorado going with the well, Republican. The Democrats don't win a lot of presidential elections anymore, yet in the last 51 years, the uh, Republicans have only controlled the House of Representatives for four years yeah. out of half a century. Mm -hmm. So that there is a balancing that goes on in the electorate that's very interesting in the United States. That's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting what is happening this time because this president is going to sweep the country and yet there are pockets of considerable democratic strength that remain out there and, and not to sweep in the house as you indicated. We'll be back. We expect to hear from President Reagan momentarily at the Century Plaza Hotel in Los Angeles, a big night of celebrating for him. He is 73 years old, about to enter his second term as president of the United States. All that more from NBC News election headquarters after this. Good evening once again from the NBC News election headquarters in New York, and the night belongs to Ronald Reagan in the presidential race. There you see him entering the ballroom at the Century Plaza Hotel with his wife Nancy, who suffered a nasty bump earlier in this week, but she seems to be okay now. She joins the president at the podium at that hotel in West Los Angeles. The familiar flags that were uh, so prevalent in both campaigns, that's young Ron Reagan and uh, Maureen Reagan and her husband to her right there, and Patty and her husband to his right up on the stage. Triumphant moment for the Reagan family. Young Ron and Patty Reagan are the children of the President and Nancy Reagan. Maureen is a, a daughter by uh, the President's first marriage to Jane Wyman and a very active campaigner on his behalf, an outspoken advocate of women's rights working out of the Republican National Committee. President's brother that you can see with the glasses in the background. Look at the hair in that family. I mean, he's older than the I, president. Uh, <laughs> I think that's just been arranged. Well, thank you all very much. It, it seems, it seems he seems we did this four years ago and. Let me just say, well, you know, good habits are hard to break. Just a short time ago, Walter Mondale phoned me, and who, you no, know, he conceded. You know what he told me? He told me that the, he told me the people had made their decision. And therefore, we were all Americans. We'd go forward together. So, but Nancy and I would, would like to express
Fancy, fancy. You know, we could, we could spend the rest of the next four years thanking all of those who have made this night possible. And, but there are a few I'd like to mention this evening. First, Nancy and I want to express our, our warmth and our deep gratitude to George and Barbara Bush. And George, uh, yes. And George, George, if you're watching down there in Texas, thank you for campaigning so magnificently all across this country. And believe me, I'm very proud to have you as my partner for this next term. As far as I'm concerned, there has never been a finer vice president. And a thank you, and a, a thank you too to Paul Laxalt, our campaign chairman. Paul is in Washington, and I understand he's there watching in a room like this with people like yourself who are there for the same reason. And there is no better personal yeah. friend than I've ever had, and there's no better ally to have at your side when you're in a campaign. And Paul, we're grateful for all that you've done over the years. And all of you there in the Shoreham Hotel Ballroom, a deep thanks for all that you have done. And Paul would be the first to say how much help he had and what an outstanding job was done by Ed Rollins, our campaign director. And Ed, please know how grateful I am for the way you put together the finest campaign organization, I think, in the history of American politics. Our thanks, too, to Mayor Margaret Hance, our deputy campaign chairwoman. She gave of her time so generously. Back in Washington, we owe so much to the great work of the Republican National Committee and its chairman, Frank Ferencoff. <laughs> Frank and all those dedicated people who work with him gave, well, they give politics a good name. We wouldn't have enjoyed this victory tonight without them. And now I have a special thank you for something that began here in this state almost 20 years ago. First by the dozens, and then by the hundreds, and finally by the thousands, we've seen our friends, all of you volunteers and workers who came to our side to help. Thank From you. From California, then across the United States, you have each given selflessly of yourselves. And I, I have no words to properly thank you for all that you've done. We set out, I remember, back those almost 20 years ago, and said that we could start a prairie fire here in California, one that would capture the intensity of our devotion to freedom and the strength of our commitment to American ideals. Well, we began to carry a message to every corner of the nation a simple message. The message is, here in America, the people are in charge. And that's really why we're here tonight. This electoral victory belongs to you and the principles that you cling to, principles struck by the brilliance and bravery of patriots more than 200 years ago. They set forth the course of liberty, and hope that makes our country special in the world. To the extent that what has happened today reaffirms those principles, we are part of that prairie fire that we still think defines America, a fire of hope that will keep alive the promise of opportunity as we head into the next century. Four years ago, when we celebrated victory in this same room, our country was faced by some deep and serious problems. 
but instead of complaining together, we rolled up our sleeves and began working together. We said we would get inflation under control, and we did. We said we would get America working again, and we've created more than six and a half million new jobs. We said that we would work to restore traditional values in our society, and we have begun. And we said we would slow down the growth of government and the rate of its spending increases, and we did. We said we'd get interest rates down, and we did. We said we would rebuild our defenses and make America prepared for peace, and we have. Now, now I wish I could take credit for this, but the credit, no, the credit belongs to the American people, to each of you. But our work isn't finished. There's much more to be done. We want to make every family more secure, to help those in our inner cities, on our farms, and in some of our older industries which are not yet back on their feet. And the recovery will not be complete until it's complete for everyone. By, by, re, by rebuilding our strength, we can bring ourselves closer to the day when all nations can begin to reduce nuclear weapons and ultimately banish them from the Earth entirely. You know, so many people act as if this election means the end of something. But the, the, vision, the vision we outlined in 1980, indeed the passion of the fire that we kept burning for two decades doesn't jive just because four years have passed. To each one of you I say, tonight is the end of nothing, it's the beginning of everything. done only prepares us for what we're going to do. We must continue not only into those next four years, but into the next decade and the next century to meet our goal of sustained economic growth without inflation and to keep America strong. Our society is a society of unlimited opportunity, which will reach out to every American and includes lifting the weak and nurturing the less fortunate. We fought many years for our principles. Now we'll work to keep those principles in practice. That's what we have to leave to our children and to their children, and they are what this campaign was all about. We've come together again, we're united again, and now let's start building together and keep that prairie fire alive, and let's never stop shaping that society which lets each person's dreams unfold into a life of unending hope. America's best days lie ahead. And you know, you forgive me, I've got, I'm going to do it just one more time. You ain't seen nothing yet. God bless you. Thank you all very much.
they assembled on the stage there and uh, John Chancellor pointed out a few moments ago it was a speech like a man running behind in the polls. He was still uh, campaigning. Well, he was campaigning when he accepted the nomination of his party uh, in Dallas. He's been campaigning. He's a terrific, unstoppable campaigner. There was some speculation on the part of a couple of people that uh, Mondale would have a real shot this fall because Reagan would sit on his lead. Well, that didn't exactly happen. <laughs> Lots of things that didn't happen. This is part of the uh, standard Reagan campaign appearance now. A little silver confetti that comes down, the flags, the music, God bless the USA, all the theme song. As far as spelling out what he's going to do in the second term, it really comes right down to that catchphrase that he's been using all along. You ain't seen nothing yet, but beyond that, not much in the way of specifics. The president having said earlier that uh, peace and prosperity would be the uh, top items on the uh, agenda. You know, another one of the paradoxes of this election, Tom, is that the man we see there on the screen is enormously popular, as is demonstrated by 59% of the popular vote now. But the, uh, uh, the fact is that he hasn't brought a conservative tide to the United States. When we uh, first, when we asked the voters four years ago if they thought they were conservative, they gave us an answer, and that figure has not changed one bit in the four years of the first Reagan administration. So that while he is conservative and more Americans now call themselves conservatives and liberals by a, a considerable margin, the country hasn't changed uh, in terms of its view of itself, the American voters' view of themselves. And so he has not produced a great Republican tide. What he has produced, it seems to me, is a great Reagan tide. Well, he has been a kind of spiritual political leader for the past four years. and. Uh that came a fruition tonight in this campaign in terms of what Ronald Reagan wanted for himself. Chris Wallace is down there in that crowd tonight. Chris, you've been uh, traveling with these folks, uh, poking away at them for the uh, last several months now, trying to find, find out what, in fact, that they do have in mind. You expect that we'll have a wholesale change of uh, personnel? You said earlier tonight that the president's comfortable with the folks he has around him, but do you think that, for example, in the cabinet that Donovan can survive at labor, that Cap Weinberger will continue at the Defense Department, George Schultz at State? Well, Tom, I don't think there are going to be any wholesale changes in the cabinet. We are told, in fact, the president said tonight when he was up in his suite watching TV returns and we were allowed in, that he's very happy with his team. He thinks it's a good team. I think you may see some changes in the lower levels of the cabinet. Uh, for instance, I think Terrell Bell, the uh, Secretary of Education, may leave. There's a possibility that Margaret Heckler might leave. But I think the top policy-making level, the Castro Weinbergers, George Schultz's, Jim Bakers, that that team will stay intact at least for the first six months of next year because the president very much wants to make something of this mandate, and he wants an experienced team that will hit the ground running next January. Tom? Thanks. Chris Wallace at uh, the Reagan campaign headquarters tonight. And uh, now we're going to Houston, Texas, where you see uh, George Bush and his family assembled before an American flag protocol on election night. The top of the ticket gets to go first. Thank now here's George much. Bush, who has been uh, living in a hotel in Houston as his unofficial residence in that state. Mrs. Bush in the far right, Thank members of his family, including his brother and some so of his much. sons, their wives. You've been here five hours. Where'd you get all that energy? Thank you very much. You know, four years ago, four years ago here in Houston, right here, four years ago, we celebrated a great victory, a new beginning. And I remember saying to many of you here tonight that with Ronald Reagan as president, our country would soon be on the road to economic recovery at home and to peace overseas. And that was the promise of the new beginning in 1980. And it's because that promise was kept that we're here again celebrating a magnificent victory in 1984. <laughs> to our friends and neighbors here in Houston and across Texas and across this country, Barbara and I and the entire Bush family Thank you for the help you've given us, not just in this campaign, not just these past four years, but for all the years we worked together for community, state, and country. And to all the dedicated workers at the Reagan-Bush Committee in Texas and in Washington and all across this country, 
and the thousands of volunteers. That, this is your victory. You made it possible. And in the coming four years, as in the past four years, and you just heard this president, you just heard our great president, he and I will dedicate our efforts to making your vision of America a reality. And to those who supported our opponents, let me say that we recognize the outcome of this election as a mandate to represent not just those who supported the Reagan-Bush ticket, but to represent all Americans. For in this hour, for in this hour of victory, this wonderful hour of victory, let's not forget that the strength of our free system lies not only in the right of the majority to express its will, but in the right of all Americans to have their voices heard and their interests served. And this, this has been a, a long, hard-fought campaign, a historic campaign. And a little while ago, and a little while ago, a little while ago, I had a most gracious phone call from Geraldine Ferraro. She campaigned hard. She was a strong opponent. No, she worked very, very hard. A strong opponent. Barbara and I both talked to her and thanked her and sent our best wishes to her and to her family. And now in the great American tradition after every election, let's come together as one people, united and indivisible, to share a common purpose, to realize the dream held by all Americans, regardless of party, the universal goal of peace and prosperity and opportunity for all. Thank you all, and God bless you. Thank you for this fantastic support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's great. Vice President George Bush and his wife Thank Barbara Bush uh, at the podium in uh, Houston, Texas, making an appearance tonight. Vice President uh, was an indefatigable cheerleader for President Reagan and the accomplishments of the administration during the past four years in the course of this campaign. And it took a lot of heat for that. In the press, in editorials and cartoons, he was described by the Washington Post as the Cliff Barnes of American politics, the character in Dallas who's always coming up on the short end of a deal with JR and complaining about it. Gary Trudeau, the cartoonist in Doonesbury, had uh, George Bush placing his manhood in a blind trust at one point in the course of the cartoons. Well, and George Bush said on television here the other day, in a jocular way, he said, I don't want to risk my manhood by answering this question. That's right. He picked up on it. He said he didn't read those cartoons as well. We'll be back with more on election night, 1984, but that's where the election stands at this time. We're back. Roger, you think there's any chance at all that George Bush could ever win the Republican nomination for president in four years? Oh, yeah, there's a chance. I uh, <clears throat> just look, uh, recalling what we've heard this evening, I think probably the most devastating comment I've heard in public um, was uh, uttered by Lynn Knopfsinger tonight when Emory King was interviewing him, and he asked uh, Mr. Knopfsinger, uh, you think uh, you think George Bush helped himself uh, by the way he campaigned this year? And I said, yeah, I think he helped himself a little. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the conservative wing of the party is going to be just so determined to make sure that he doesn't get that nomination, and they still control the process in the GOP. Well, I they, they wrote the platform. They can they control this convention. They will control the next convention. Right. And they're, as you say, Tom, they are very, very suspicious that he is a conservative in sheep's clothing. Yeah. And uh, I must say that George Bush does uh, sometimes damages his own uh, uh, image. Jim Dickinson of the Washington Post tells the story about George Bush being asked once if, why he wore those Brooks Brothers suits. Didn't they give him a, a, a preppy image? And, and Bush said, well, for one thing, he said, I don't think they give me a preppy image. He said, the other thing, he says, they're not from Brooks Brothers. He said, they're from J Press, right. one of the leading <laughs> preppy suppliers in the United States. Yeah. I think he's fun to campaign with and fun to watch, but I think he makes at least his share of mistakes when he's out on campaign. 
Uh, we're going to project another state for uh, guess who? We have very few. <laughs> guess who? Ronald Reagan wins the state of Hawaii tonight. Hawaii is one of those states that goes Democratic generally, but uh, this time we are projecting John Chancellor in Hawaii right there on your screen. There is the state of Hawaii, the string of islands, color them blue tonight for uh, Ronald Reagan. The last couple of elections they've gone for the Democrats, but not this time. And the Reagan total continues to roll on. That's the Electoral College total now, 522 to just three for Walter Mondale. The District of Columbia, not a state, of course, 522 electoral votes. This is what the national vote shows at this time. There's the map. That tells the whole story. It's all blue. Four years ago, David Brinkley described the map as looking like a suburban swimming pool, and now it looks like an entire ocean. Okay. We have some uh, popular boat landslides down through the years in the 20th century, and you can make a comparison of how well Ronald Reagan is doing tonight and is likely to do with, say, the vote in 1920 when Warren Harding won by uh, 26 points that time against his Democratic opponent, Mr. Cox. In 1936, FDR elected to a second term, had a win, as you can see, of uh, 24 points over uh, Alf Landon in the election of 1930. Uh, 36. There was also a landslide in 1964 that many of you can remember. Lyndon Johnson winning 61% of the vote, slightly more than that, to Barry Goldwater's 39% of the vote. Actually, Goldwater had just uh, over 38% of the vote. That was another huge win in Electoral College lines. 22 points in that one. That's kind of the modern day standard. And in 1972, George McGovern lost to Richard Nixon uh, by uh, 23 points in that election. 23 points. Well, it seems unlikely that it's going to go that high tonight, but here's where it stands right now. It's an 18-point spread, 68%, two-thirds of the precincts have reported so far. So it could slide up to 20 points, but maybe not 21, 22, certainly not the days of Warren Harding when it went as high as 26 points. Nonetheless, a devastating loss tonight for Walter Mondale and for Geraldine Ferraro. And uh, Connie Chung is in Washington tonight with a man who knows all about... Uh, some of the pain, the trauma of an evening like this, but made a remarkable comeback in the Democratic primaries this time. Former Senator from the great state of South Dakota, George McGovern with Connie Chung. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Senator McGovern, you are in the unique position of fully appreciating and understanding how Walter Mondale feels tonight. Share your thoughts with us. Well, I think, first of all, he has the satisfaction of knowing that he gave it his very best effort. No one could have campaigned any harder or more... Uh, committedly than Mondale did over the last uh, few months. Uh, but he's going to be disappointed. The fact that uh, only one state in the District of Columbia went with him, I know uh, makes him feel a little bit down. I had that same experience 12 years ago. Do I think he's taken my title away from me as the most <laughs> defeated uh, Democratic candidate. That's right. As we were watching, you, you yelled over to one of our uh, producers here and asked just how many uh, electoral votes were in Minnesota. And you noted what you took 17 electoral votes. I had 17 electoral votes. If, uh, if Walter Mondale gets Minnesota, he'll end up with 13 electoral votes. But that's not the point. The point is it was a hard-fought uh, campaign. I doubt if anyone could have defeated Ronald Reagan in 1984. Really? He was Not at the Gary peak. Hart, perhaps? I don't think it would have made much difference whether we had John Glenn or Gary Hart or Walter Mondale or whoever it was. Uh, this man was not to be beaten in 1984. Senator George McGovern, thank you for being with us. Tom? Thanks, Connie. There's the map that we've been talking about. George McGovern, wondering whether or not, in fact, he'll go into second place now against uh, Walter Mondale, but also identifying with the pain that he must be feeling tonight. By the way, Mondale still has not won the state of Minnesota. That is his home state. We have not been able to make a projection in Minnesota, although he leads now by about eight percentage points with uh, more than half of the precincts reporting in, but we can't make a projection there yet. There it is on the map before you. It tells the story of this evening in the presidential race, at least, a huge victory for Ronald Reagan. Decision 84, election night continues. Sponsored by Sun Company, where there's sun, there's energy. And by IBM. Now from the NBC News Election Center in New York, here is Tom Brokaw. 
Good morning once again. Good morning in the Eastern Time Zone at least. It is still late at night, of course, in the Western Time Zone and uh, in the Central Time Zone just coming up at midnight. And this day belongs to Ronald Reagan in the presidential race. He has a commanding lead over Walter Mondale, perhaps of historic proportions. Walter Mondale still holding on to the state of Minnesota. We cannot make a call there, but so far of all the other states that have checked in and the results that we have been able to analyze, the winner, Ronald Reagan, 522 electoral votes to just three for Walter Mondale from the District of Columbia so far. And here's how it translates in terms of the popular vote nationwide. 70% of the precincts have now checked in. An 18-point lead for the ticket of Reagan and Bush over Mondale and Ferraro at this hour. That is a landslide, however you describe it, and it is true as well in the Electoral College vote. Now, something has been happening around the country. That is, Republicans at every turn have been claiming a mandate, saying that with the size of this presidential election, that everyone will just have to roll over and play it the president's way for the next four years or so. But in the House of Representatives, the Republicans were able to pick up only 17 seats. I say only 17 seats because there had been hopes on the part of the GOP that they would get back the 26 that they lost two years ago, perhaps as many as 30, and that they would have a clear ideological majority in the House of Representatives, if not a numerical majority. And I think that it's what down to about two Senate seats uh, that the Democrats perhaps have picked up before this night is out in the Senate. All of this of great interest to the Speaker of the House of Representatives, who's been following in this tonight from the Capitol in Washington, and that is Speaker Thomas P. Tip O'Neill. Not a very good night for the Democrats nationwide, Mr. Speaker, for the fourth time of the last five presidential elections. Why do you think the country has been turning its back on Democratic presidential candidates? We've now had an outsider in Jimmy Carter, someone from the left wing of the party in George McGovern, and somebody from the mainstream in Walter Mondale. None of this has begun to work. Well, all I can tell you is about tonight, the President of the United States uh, was a tremendously popular individual, probably the most popular man in the history of this government. We've never seen his like. He's, an, he's excellent on, a, on media. You know, I, I quote uh, being at a parade recently where some women said to me, Tip, we love you. Keep fighting Reagan, but we're voting for Reagan. It, it didn't make sense to me, but that's the way it is across America. You made reference to the fact that there's 17 seats out there that we've lost. Well, at the present time, I have in my pocket what we have. Uh, we've lost three seats, and we've lost uh, five open seats, and we've beaten about four Republicans. And as we analyze it right now, we won't lose more than 10 or 12 seats. So while it may be a mandate of the popularity of the President of the United States, the, uh, the people certainly show uh, they want both the Democratic House and the Democratic Senate to be a safety net against any wild ideas that the President of the United States may have out there about Social Security or uh, cutting uh, new taxes or putting in new taxes or things of that nature. Well, you, heard the, you heard the president tonight talk about uh, cutting uh, government waste and going back to the priorities of, uh, of the first four years that he had in office. He's going to resubmit many of the uh, items that he had in the budget and he wants to get them cut. Do you think that we'll have gridlock for the next two years that you'll no, be battling as him a right matter, to a draw? No, as a matter of fact, we're going to be very, very decent, very fair with him. Uh, the Speaker of the House has the, po the power of recognition and the power of bringing legislation to the floor. I can only bring that legislation to the floor if it's reported out of committee. If there's going to be a tax program, it's going to be the tax program of uh, Ronald Reagan. If there's going to be uh, uh, the cutting of the colas for uh, the veterans or uh, veterans' pensions or, or uh, Social Security benefits or anything of that nature, it's going to be the programs of the President. We're going to be very, very fair with the president. He made a tremendous amount of promises and pledges to the American people, and we're going to give him the opportunity to keeping them. Uh, if there's to be a tax bill, Ronald Reagan is going to have to say to the American people, this is Ronald Reagan's tax bill. He's not going to hide behind the fact uh, that uh, a, a coalition of Democrats and Republicans put a bill out there over my dead body, and then I'm going to acquiesce at the last minute to stop, save the government uh, from stopping running or something of that nature. Uh, there's no question in my mind that uh, the president is popular. Is there a mandate? Yeah, there's a mandate that the president is extremely well liked in America. About his programs? No question. I think we're here for a safety net. Mr. Speaker, this is Roger Mudd. Yes, Roger. How are you, sir? Pretty good, and you? Good. You mentioned a moment ago that, uh, that you were going to stop any wild ideas the president might have. Right. No nothing drives the president up the wall so quickly as to hear you say that he's going to cut Social Security. 
Uh, you don't believe him, do you? No, I don't, to be perfectly truthful. But every but he time, said, I, uh, again every and again, time I saw him on a speech and would hear him, I'd like to look right on his, his eyes and he'd say, Tip, you know I don't mean this while I'm saying it. Why, why, why don't you take him at his word? Well, I don't take him at his word because there's so many trial balloons around here. Dave Stockman said the big bucks are in Social Security, they're in veterans' pensions, they're in uh, civilian uh, employee pensions, and they're in, uh, they're in the, the health programs. And I believe that they're going to go after those. Uh, uh, Don Regan uh, throws out a, a balloon, a, a feeler, about uh, where we're going tax-wise. We'll, we'll tax the, uh, the unemployment compensation, the, the, the workman's compensation. Uh, we'll uh, uh, tax, uh, take away the tax that your deduction you get on real estate, on, on second mortgages, on the real estate tax that you pay at home, on the personal. There has to be a tax bill out there, but this tax bill that's going to come is going to be the presidents of the United States. Now, Don Regan isn't sending these things out in, in Washington. You know, the, the walls have ears. We hear these things. They, they want to say, well, you knew about these things uh, during the campaign because we had trial balloons out there. Mr. Speaker, uh, a couple quick questions. Did you have an opponent today? I had a communist opponent. <laughs> How'd you do, sir? Well, I think that uh, she may have got one half of one percent. So uh, you're back in the House for one last term, one is that right? One last term, yes, right. Uh, uh, for the last couple of weeks, we've been hearing uh, about some of the young Democrats who are uh, uh, angling to uh, uh, try to put a move on you. Have you heard about those moves? No, I haven't. Uh, and I hear everything that's going on up here. You don't feel threatened, your speakership? Uh, no? No, not at all. I, I think that's the, uh, the imagination of people in the media who like to try to make stories. <laughs> well... I was just passing on uh, lots thank, of, sir. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> I, I keep, I keep a, a keen look at the house at all times. All right. Well, are, you, are you ending the interview, Mr. Speaker? Yeah. No, I'm willing to <laughs> stay here as long as you want me to. Okay. The walls only have so many years, though. Isn't that right, Mr. Right. Speaker? And, and not for that. And are you really, just to, just to one more, sir, is, have, you, have you struck a deal with the president about being uh, going to Ireland as the ambassador? Well, of course, when I made that statement some time ago, he, he called me and said, Tip, I'll give it to you the day after tomorrow if you're really interested. But if he, if he sent you to Dublin, <laughs> he, you, he wouldn't be hearing you complain about Social Security anymore, would he? No, I, it, really, <laughs> uh, it really upsets him when I complain like that. But I have to complain like that to keep him honest. Mr. Speaker, thanks very much for being with us tonight. Thank you. Okay, we'll look forward to the next couple of years. Fine. Okay, House Speaker Thomas P. Tip O'Neill, uh, he made a last-minute uh, appearance on behalf of Walter Mondale in Boston the other day, and yet Democrats lost the presidential race in, uh, in the state of Massachusetts tonight. Um, we're now well into the morning here in uh, the East Coast, and uh, the vote is beginning uh, to finally wrap it all up. We are waiting only the returns from Minnesota so that we can make a call there, and also from the state of Alaska. We'll be back with more on Election Night 1984 right after this. We're back here at NBC News Election Headquarters on Election Night 1984. Uh, Ronald Reagan has long since wrapped up the presidential race, but there are some very tight races still going on around the country for governor and also for senator. We can always count on the state of Illinois to give us one of those suspenseful races. And it has done it again tonight. Senator Charles Percy, who is the incumbent Republican senator with a very strong challenge from Mr. Simon. Roger? Well, it couldn't be much closer, Tom. Uh, it could not be much closer. 75% of the precincts in, Simon 51%, Percy 48%. That's a three and a third million votes cast, and Simon's margin is only 100,000 votes. Mr. Simon, who is the downstate uh, Democratic congressman, is uh, doing well in Chicago and Cook County. He's got a 35-point lead over uh, Percy. He's got a 7-point lead in downstate Illinois. Percy is doing well in the suburbs of uh, Chicago, leading Simon by about 15 points. And he's doing fairly well in the northwest section of the state, leading by about 11 points. So that will go to the wire, 74% of the precincts in. At the Percy headquarters, standing by to uh, give us the benefit of the Percy headquarters thinking is Mary Nissenson. Mary, are they uh, are keeping are they keeping their heads down, waiting for some final break on the on the votes? No, Roger. In fact, Senator Percy just came down a few moments ago, and he neither conceded defeat nor claimed victory. This is a very close race. 
And while the Percy people are saying they are optimistic, they have to be a little bit disappointed with what was happening downstate. Percy should have done much better there. They're trying to cover for that by saying that Percy did a little bit better in Chicago, where they expected him to do worse. If Percy does lose, Roger, I think there will be an important political lesson in this for many people. Percy, in a desperate move to win this election, sort of grabbed onto Reagan's coattails. He had been a liberal Republican when he started. He became much more conservative in this race. And there is a theory that he lost a lot of his black support, a lot of his Jewish support in doing that, but never gained the ultra-right wing of the Republican Party. So in that sense, he grabbed under the coattails and perhaps just got dragged through the mud. Uh, 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 M-U-D. <laughs> That's right. All right. Absolutely. Well, you, you said, uh, uh, Mary, that uh, they were disappointed they didn't do better downstate. Why did they think they do so well downstate when that's where Simon is from? Well, there is a theory in Illinois that traditionally a heavy downstate turnout will favor the Republican, that the farming population here has gone towards the Republicans. But the farming population has been very displeased with Percy lately, and they have been pushing more towards Simon. Simon's real appeal, despite his geographic origin, was to the more liberal Democrats, and of course they are centered in Chicago, Roger. What, uh, what are Senator Percy's current relationships with the uh, Republican establishment in uh, Illinois? I'm talking about the, the old line, not the liberal uh, uh, lakefront uh, group, but I'm the, the, the basic uh, mainstream Republicans in the state. Are they good or well, just uh, uh, distant? They are better than they used to be, and that's because during this election, Percy has tried to become a real Reagan supporter. But he can't win the most conservative element. His position on abortion, which is pro-choice, has alienated a lot of the more conservative Republicans. And there are those Republicans who look askance at Percy, who say, you weren't a real Republican, you weren't a real Reaganite. It's now only when you're really desperate to win that you join our camp. And so he isn't really as welcome in that camp as he would like to be. All right, Mary, thank you. We'll be uh, keeping tabs on the race. How, uh, what, what do you think, how much longer do you think it's going to be, by the way? I think this may be like the Stevenson-Thompson gubernatorial race of uh, just a while back. I think it may not be until the wee hours of the morning that we know, Roger. Okay, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Our NBC News coverage will continue uh, in a moment after these messages. NBC News election headquarters on election night 1984 and one of the themes that Walter Mondale hoped to stick to Ronald Reagan during the course of the campaign was the deficit. What are you going to do about it, Mr. President? You're going to have to raise taxes. Here's what the deficit is doing to our national economy. Here's how the deficit is costing you. I've got charts. I've got maps. I'm going to talk about the deficit. The deficit seemed to go nowhere during the course of the campaign. Well, well Chancellor, what about the poll? Well, you do find that there is a little bit of uh, apprehension about the deficit out there. Uh, people do know that something is going to have to be done about it. And from one of our questions, we asked, will the deficits hurt you? It, it, it looks as though people are genuinely worried. Yes, said 46%. Now, a lot of people don't even know what deficits are. So when 46% say it will hurt, as opposed to 28% saying no, you pay attention to a figure on that. 26% don't know, and many of us may feel that way about it. But the president says that prosperity will grow us out of the deficits. Not very many people believe that. Many said only higher taxes, and Walter Mondale said let's pay higher taxes to cut it. Well, Mondale's position drew 32% yes from the voters today, but 50% said no, and 18% said not sure, which is a rejection of the Mondale plan. So that while people are worried about the deficit, and legitimately so, it's huge and getting bigger all the time, they do not want themselves, at least half of them, to pay higher taxes to do anything about it. And Tom, it just seems to me that this is one of the, the, the you're going to have to pay the piper on this some way, and that the, the economy, hardly anybody believes that the economy will magically grow and reduce the deficit. Well, you heard House Speaker O'Neill tonight talking about Donald Reagan and those and the, and the walls that have ears in Washington hearing about the plan to tax, uh, for example, now that you, you'll no longer be able to deduct the interest payments on a second home or on some mortgages or a house on uh, state and local sales taxes and so on. Mike Jensen, you've been following all of this in the financial community. What do they think down there, those wizards of Wall Street, about what is likely to happen in the next year? Tom, they really think that it's going to have to be a combination of cutting costs and of raising taxes and that there is no way the administration is going to 
get through this, to reduce that deficit, to do what the president has said he wants to do, that is bring down interest rates without doing both of those things. And what, what do you think will happen in the, in the economy in the next, say, six to eight weeks or so as a result of this overwhelming election of Ronald Reagan tonight? Well, it depends on the success they have in doing these. On the one hand, you have this mandate for Ronald Reagan. On the other hand, you don't have very much of a gain for the Republicans in the House. That means it's going to be very difficult for the Republicans to accomplish, first of all, this kind of getting the government out of people's lives. In order to do that effectively, to take a piece out of the government expenses, it would require cutting into programs like Medicare, Medicaid, uh, government pensions for government employees, um, farm subsidies, and those are going to be very, very difficult to do. And then on the tax side, it will be even more difficult because the president has said that he does not intend to raise individual tax brackets, and that means some kind of a flat tax, which will be tough, and also possibly a value-added tax at some point. Well, let me, a make a, tax. let me make an observation here. It seems to me, Mike, based on the size of the president's electoral vote victory today and how good he must feel about the way that map looks, that he is not going to be pushed or cozened in any way into a tax increase plan. I mean, I think he just, he has a right now to say no, I said no, and I mean no. There isn't any ambiguity about his position with the voters. And I think probably what that means, John, is that he will go for what they call a flat tax, which is a reduction in everybody's tax brackets with an elimination of loopholes to try to make up the difference. He has called that a revenue neutral tax, meaning it won't raise any more money. But it will. But that leaves us, also, it, it will a bit, and it also leaves us with this horrendous deficit, which will require some kind of revenue to be raised, and that's where a hidden tax, such as a sales tax, a value-added tax, mm -hmm. would come in farther along the line. Mike, uh, uh, when the wizards of Wall Street talk about cutting costs, do they know where there are some costs to cut? No, I think that's the thing, Roger. Everybody talks about getting the government out of your life, but nobody wants it to be their life. It's going to really cut into these, as I said, the areas that were avoided uh, during the first Reagan administration. Social Security areas. NBC News uh, economics correspondent Mike Jensen. In the few seconds that we have here, I want to tell my favorite story of the campaign. Art Buckwald speaking before a group of moguls, mostly captains of industry. How many of you are for Ronald Reagan? Every hand in the room went up. They're all for Ronald Reagan. Now Buckwald waits for the hands to come down. He says, how many of you would like him to run your company? No hands went up. One guy came up and said, I'm still going to vote for him, but it won't be as much fun. That's where the election stands at this time. We're back. Mike Jensen, uh, NBC's economics correspondent, is here. Mike, question I have for you. Are companies now beginning to hedge their bets about planning for the new calendar year because of what they may see is what's going on in Washington, this gridlock over the deficit, and they don't want to get too far down the road, get entangled in higher interest rates, for example, nine months, a year from now? It's, a curious, it's almost paradoxical, Tom, because on the one hand, businessmen really do like Ronald Reagan. They think he's good for business. They think he's good for the economy. On the other hand, in the last couple of months, the economy has really leveled off. Um, there is some feeling that it is doing that because interest rates are still relatively high. The president is absolutely right when he says that he has brought them down, but they are still relatively high. And that means that businesses are bumping up against these high borrowing costs, and there's a lot of concern that they will begin rising again. Most economists, most Wall Street people think the economy will begin to rise again and rise gradually, but that it will not realize its, its potential until interest rates come down, which will only happen when the deficit comes down. I can't see any real resolution of that in Washington in the, in, <laughs> in the next six months. No, I think it's worse than that. And I think that you've got not only a presidential election coming up for four years, but you've got the, uh, the 1986 House races coming up and a lot of very skittish people in the, in the Congress. When, uh, I know they have elections every two years, but there are different kinds of elections. And uh, I think they're going to be very vulnerable without a Ronald Reagan to shelter against many you, of them. You heard the speaker tonight. Uh, he, he virtually uh, dared 
right. Ronald Reagan and the Republicans to come at him. Mm -hmm. You just try. Well, it. and, yeah, and if the speaker was right in his estimate uh, of how little the Republicans gained in the House, that's going to make the battle ferocious. I think blood will really flow on Capitol Hill over the next couple of years. And in the meantime, Rome burns. The deficit keeps getting bigger, and this government seems incapable of doing anything about it. Well, thanks very much, Mike Jensen, for that uh, note of gloom that you bring to us tonight. <laughs> It'll be an interesting time to watch, and it, of course it uh, touches the lives of every American because everybody has to pay those interest rates sooner or later Indeed. in one form or another. We're going to take you right now through the numbers as we have them at this hour. The electoral vote, 270 required. I've said that all night long. Look at, look at what uh, Ronald Reagan has. 522 electoral votes, just three for Walter Mondale. In the national race now, that is the popular vote. Nearly three-quarters of the precincts have checked in. The uh, Reagan-Bush lead remains at 18 points over Mondale and Ferraro. Tonight uh, in Los Angeles, Heidi Schulman has been uh, watching all of these returns all evening long with a group of people who are, well, slightly older than most of us, but they're very active voters indeed, and she's going to tell us about what some of their reactions are tonight. Heidi? Tom, we're in the midst of a party for senior citizens at a federally subsidized housing complex in Los Angeles. During the campaign, whenever the candidates talked about cutting social programs, cutting programs for the poor, cutting programs for the elderly, these were the people they're talking about. And most of them here tonight have been Democrats. Lydia Minyard, you told me that many of you, your friends, you yourself, are apprehensive in the face of the Reagan landslide. Apprehensive about what? Uh, I, myself, uh, have a, a potential, I think. I always feel everything is going to be okay. And I think here, the spirit tonight is that. There, there has been some people that are a little intimidated and they feel a little, uh, a little upset and uh, wonder just what the next four years will bring. We, we hope and we feel that everything will, will be okay. Rever Reverend John Lee, you are president of the senior organization here. What do you expect in a practical way for people here in the next four years under the Reagan administration? Well, there's no joy here tonight in this huge senior citizens complex. Low-income senior citizens are worried. We're frightened because we know that the Reagan administration will attempt to cut back further on our Social Security benefits, that they will cut back on Medicare and Medicaid, and that they will do everything they possibly can to undermine the subsidized rental and public housing program. But the president said repeatedly during the campaign that he would not cut Social Security benefits, that he would indeed take care of the people who needed taking care of. Do you not trust that promise? Uh, he has made this promise four years ago, and he broke the promise, and we anticipate he will break it again. Lydia Minier, do you feel the same way? Do you trust the promises that were made during this campaign? I hope he keeps the promises he made this four years. He didn't exactly keep them the last four years, and uh, we're, we're hoping that he will. We just hope that he will. We're hopeful that he will. We must go back to New York. Before we do, I should mention that there were some Republicans here tonight. We talked to some of those who voted for Ronald Reagan, who were obviously in the vast majority around the country tonight. But in uh, this group, they said they were a little reluctant to talk publicly about it. One woman told me she was afraid she'd lose all her Democratic bridge partners. Tom? <laughs> well, those are priorities on a night like this. You don't want to go too far into the tank uh, just, to, just to express your political opinion. After all, elections come once every four years. Bridge comes uh, at least once a week in some of those areas. We're going to uh, come back in just a few moments, and uh, Roger Mudd will have an important Senate race for us that he'll bring us up to date on, and we'll tell you about what's going on in the state of Minnesota as well, where Fritz Mondale continues to hope that his home state will come through for him tonight. First station right. We're back. It's now 1.30 in the morning. It is uh, the day after the election of Ronald Reagan to a second term as president of the United States. There are still a couple of very important and very close races outstanding. One in the United States Senate. Roger Mudd is now prepared to project a winner in it in Illinois. Roger. In Illinois, it is the um, Democrat Paul Simon, the projected winner in Illinois. Paul Simon defeating Charles Percy, the Republican chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, our projected winner in Illinois. The uh, popular vote shows 
Paul Simon with a thin lead. These are 78% of the precincts in, 51%, 48%. And Simon did it by an enormous margin in Chicago and Cook County, about 37 points ahead of Percy in Chicago and Cook County, and by holding Percy to a lead of just 16% in the suburbs, and by uh, uh, neutralizing the downstate advantage. Uh, Simon did it by carrying about 90% of the black vote and by uh, carrying about two-thirds of the liberal vote. So he put together a new and interesting coalition. So that will set off a uh, round of musical chairs in the uh, Senate, where Charles Percy is no longer the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. It's an open seat, and now uh, we may have a lot of movement there. Roger, what does that do to the overall Senate numbers now? I'm, I'm behind uh, on that. Uh, the overall Senate numbers are the Democrats add seats in Tennessee, Albert Gore, Jr. They add a seat in Iowa with Harkin defeating Jepson. They add a seat in Illinois with uh, Simon defeating Percy. They lose a seat in Kentucky with Huddleston losing to Mitch McConnell. So it's a net Democratic gain of two. Massachusetts is a wash. That's right. That's wash. carry for Sanger. So it's a net of two. two. A net gain <coughs> of two. So that's 5347. Right. So that's 5347. Yeah, the, uh, by the way, we want to tell you that in Kentucky, 99% of the precincts have reported in. We did project that Mr. McConnell, Mitch McConnell, would be the winner in Kentucky, but we are compelled to tell you as well that the difference now is about 4,000 votes in that race out of a million, almost 300,000 that have been cast so far. Last, last time we talked, uh, the margin was 4,031. Yeah, it, and what, what is it now? Well, it's about that. It's uh -huh. very, very close. It's 50-50, uh, 99% of the precincts in. That may change. We believe that McConnell. Uh, now let's go to Illinois where the new senator from that state is speaking, and he is Representative Paul Simon, newspaper man, writes columns, letters, this is, classic this, and American not liberal. Sleep, Gene, uh, <laughs> but this is, this is a good time to also thank some other people. I mentioned Mike Madigan, Cal Sutger, our state chairman. Let me tell you that both Harold Washington and Ed Verdoliak could not have been better. They have been great. My family, right, been right back here, they have been great. This, I, I, I want you to meet him now. Mom, you come first here, all right. This is my mother. Somebody. One of, and I, I want you to know that one of the networks made a terrible mistake tonight. They, 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 uh, they no, no, they, they, they called my mother 85 years old. She's only 77, and I want you to She's been a great campaigner. Jean has been all over the state of Illinois. <laughs> Paul Simon, we were just talking about Paul Simon. He is, uh, he's well known in Washington where he's been serving in the House of Representatives. He's an old fashioned democratic liberal. He was once, I, we believe, the national chairman of the American Civil Liberties Union. He's a prolific writer of uh, of newsletters back home from his house office, and he was a newspaper man and a columnist. Self-taught, I think that he was not even a college graduate, but he got in the newspaper business early on. You know, Tom, in, in an age when uh, politicians look all as though they've been stamped out of the same mold, right. uh, he doesn't. I he, saw he has a prairie look to him that is very familiar to me and, and, uh, and very nice. I mean, there's an authentic prairie person. I saw him the morning after he won the Democratic nomination in Illinois earlier this year. We were both arriving at O'Hare at the same time, and we were coming through the security check at the same time. He looked like a guy who was going off to make some calls on an airplane somewhere in Des Moines, mm -hmm. uh, carrying his own bag, very friendly, and I've known him a long time. So uh, Paul Simon tonight, representative from Illinois, now the senator from that state. And we'll be back with more on election night 84 after this.
We're back, and I want to bring you up to date on something. In Kentucky, we were talking about how close that race is, even though we have projected uh, uh, Mitch McConnell, the new winner of the Senate down there. I'm told by our wizards, John Ellis and uh, Roy Wetzel tonight, that it is impossible for Senator D. Huddleston to make up to a few thousand votes in the precincts that are left, so I want to get that on the record tonight. We are now able to project in the state of Alaska, Ronald Reagan, the winner of Alaska's three electoral votes tonight as he continues this enormous landslide, perhaps sweeping all 50 states before the night is out. Only the state of Minnesota, as you can see, outstanding on our map tonight. All those other states colored blue for Ronald Reagan tonight. And in Minnesota, we still cannot make a projection. That means in the electoral vote that Ronald Reagan now has amassed 525 electoral votes Walter Mondale, only three from the District of Columbia. The national, 75%, fully three quarters of that is now in. The lead is maintained by Reagan and Bush at 18 points over Mondale and Ferraro. That too, a popular vote landslide. Not a record, but a sizable one nonetheless, especially in contemporary politics. Ken Bode has been watching all of this from a perch in the Washington Square Bar and Grill in California. Uh, right there on Washington Square where things are beginning to thin out as a popular watering hole for politicians and observers of all kinds. Guys with braces in the background. Now here's Ken Bode telling us what he thinks about what's going on. Ken? Hi, Tom. It's, uh, you know, it's kind of charming to see that Minnesota is holding out for Mondale if that's the way it works out. But it looks to me from here that the Democratic Party is suffering from a severe case tonight of what we might call white flight. Our poll shows that whites voted two to one today for Ronald Reagan, the lowest proportion of the white vote that the Democratic Party has gotten in a long time. White Catholics, white blue collar workers, white Protestants were hugely for Ronald Reagan in this race. And the only three groups that Mondale carried across the country were blacks, 13 to one according to our poll, Hispanics, two to one, and Jews, two to one. Hispanics. Uh, are marginally for, uh, for the Democrats around the country, but Jews and blacks seem to be the base of the Democratic Party now, and Tom, those are two groups that don't seem to be able very well to live with one another. I think that it's clear from at least this perspective, this perch in the Washington Square Bar and Grill, I think it's a realigning election. I think we now have got confirmation that the Republican Party is probably presidentially the majority party and has been for the past couple of elections, and this really just simply confirms it. I just want to uh, maintain your objectivity, Ken, by pointing out that you have before you a glass of bubbly that is neither in sorrow nor in celebration. I mean, you play it right down the middle. Well, what about the Democratic Party? You've been paying a lot of attention to it for the past uh, 10, 15 years or so. What do you think will happen now in the next four years? Will we begin to hear from the likes of Bob Graham and Bruce Babbitt, the governor of Arizona, the governor of Florida, Bill Clinton in Arkansas? Some of those people who have not been on the national scene now begin to step forward and say, hey, look, we've been solving problems in our states. You ought to take some advice from us. Yes, I think there's no question about that, Tom, that there's going to be a group of governors in the ages from 35 to 45 who have been watching the Democratic Party from the time that George McGovern suffered an electoral landslide about the same proportions that Walter Mondale has. Now the center part of the Democratic Party has lost just as big as the left wing of the Democratic Party did. And uh, those who said tonight, and there are a lot of Democrats around here who said this is a personal mandate for Ronald Reagan, not a realigning election. It seems to me probably back in about 1936, there were a lot of Republicans who said the same thing. It's a personal mandate for Roosevelt, not a realigning election. And they learned to live with the opposite of that truth for the next 20 years or so. And you're going to see Babbitt. Uh, Babbitt is a good choice. Graham, Clinton, those fellas are going to be spending a lot of time reasserting themselves uh, in the next couple of years. Yes, I think you're going to see it, Tom. We don't want to forget uh, Governor Cuomo of New York, who was such a hit at the Democratic Convention as well, and in that very same city where you are, San Francisco, and in fact, sat in that same bar after playing in a softball game. Thanks very much, Ken Bode at the Washington Square Bar and Grill tonight. Hazardous duty for you, but someone has to volunteer for it, Ken, and we're grateful to you for going all the way out there and doing it. We'll be back after this. NBC News election headquarters here on election night, 1984, now moving into the morning, and we're getting the last of the Senate calls. Roger Mudd is taking a look at the results from the state of Alaska. 
It's Alaska, and without any surprise at all, the Republican incumbent Ted Stevens has been re-elected, according to our NBC projection, re-elected to his third term. He's a leading contender for the uh, majority leadership of the Senate. He defeated John Havelock, the former attorney general. So Stevens in Alaska. That makes the new Senate look like this. New Senate. Democrats, 47 seats. Republicans, 53 seats. A net pickup for the Democrats of two seats. Two seats. And that was about right. I lost 11,000? No, I didn't. <laughs> Everybody was in a pool of one kind or another. There were so many pools around that you started hedging your bets, saying two, two states and one, five and another, and so on. Uh, Lisa Myers and Chris Wallace have been uh, tracking this campaign from their respective positions. Lisa in the Mondale campaign. Chris Wallace, of course, our White House correspondent, chasing President Reagan around the country and around the world, for that matter. Uh, they're there in Los Angeles and in St. Paul tonight. A little quieter and a little more depressing, I suppose, in St. Paul for you, Lisa. What is the feeling there among the pros, that this was a personal triumph on the part of Ronald Reagan, or did they think it was a combination, both a personal triumph and a rejection of what Walter Mondale stood for? Two points, Tom. First of all, they never, ever dreamed it would be this bad. Most of Mondale's aides tonight simply were too t uh, stunned to try to explain it. Uh, one of them said, I just can't talk about it yet. But earlier, when discussing the possibility of a landslide in more generic terms, they said that let's, if the president won it, big, it would be a personal mandate. It would be because of the three P president's person uh, personal popularity, peace, and prosperity. The other key point, I think, tonight, Tom, has to do with what Mondale said a few hours ago right here in his concession speech, when he said that the voters made their choice with dignity and with majesty. And I think those two words could well describe the way Mondale concluded this campaign. For those of us who covered him uh, and who were baffled over the the years over the last few months anyway as to why when things were worse why when things uh, seemed almost hopeless hopeless he seemed to get become a bigger man to seem less trapped by the interest groups to seem less gripped by that paralyzing sense of caution and I think he answered that question for us tonight when he said I am at peace with the knowledge that I did everything I can that I gave it everything I've got thanks very much Lisa Myers at St. Paul tonight and Lisa thanks especially for our what I know is a grueling time for you, often on a lot of airplanes in a lot of different towns. You never quite knew where you were, but all the people who worked with you in the Mondale campaign, those of us who were here in New York are grateful for that. Chris Wallace, you, same goes to you out in Los Angeles. The president, do you think, does he have his eye on the big picture in terms of his role in history now? Will he reach out, do you think, for example, to the Soviet Union? Will he reach out to the people in this country who are the disenfranchised, the poor, the blacks, and so on? and try to build for himself the kind of image that his first political hero, Franklin Roosevelt, had. Any chance of that? Well, I think the answer to the first part of that is yes, and the answer to the second part is, is a maybe and possibly a no. In terms of the Soviet Union, I'm told by people very close to him that he really does have a strong feeling now that his legacy, his place in history, would come by making a, a major arms control reduction treaty with the Soviets and that he feels that he's uniquely positioned to do that, that just as Richard Nixon could make a deal with China and uh, no one would accuse him of selling out to China, that so he can deal with the Soviets and no one is going to think that he is soft on communism. So I think when they say now that they really want to improve relations with the Soviets, that they really want to deal, uh, that that's not just campaign rhetoric, it wasn't an election year conversion, that they really mean it. On the question of, of reaching out uh, to the minorities, to the, uh, the less well-off, it was interesting because he talked about that a lot tonight in his victory statement, but that's hard to do because the fact is that he basically does not believe in government. Uh, he thinks that uh, spending programs should be cut back. Uh, they feel that in addition to the middle class entitlements that there's a lot more money they can get out of those what they call discretionary domestic programs. And so he can talk a lot about uh, trying to reach out to the afflicted. But if you're going to cut the programs on which they depend, uh, it's awfully hard to uh, emulate FDR. So I think that, yes, there is going to be a strong feeling that this one is for the history book, but on the other hand, as he said, we have fought a lifetime for these conservative principles, and we're not about to give up on them now. Thanks. Chris Wallace, uh, we'll be watching all of this from uh, your post at the White House in coming days. Roger Mudd, any thoughts tonight on this extraordinary Ronald Reagan victory and what it may mean to the future? Well, I, my only thought is uh, I don't want to be partisan about it, but I uh, agree well, with Well, then Ken don't be. You don't have to be. All right. I, I don't mean to be, uh, but I agree with Ken Bode. Thank God for Minnesota. I hope Minnesota goes for Mondale. 
I hope one state in the United States uh, awards this man uh, some small measure of what he has coming to him. I hope we don't have a unanimous vote. The last time it happened, and I hope it's uh, the only time, was when George Washington <laughs> got it. There was a chance when Monroe was going to get a unanimous vote, and there was an elector from New Hampshire who said George Washington is the only one who ought to be unanimous, and I'm voting against it. So I hope Minnesota that's comes not in. That's partisan. That's pro-Washington. That's, <laughs> <all right. laughs> that's right. Well, Roger covered that campaign, and he has I know. a kind of vested interest. With Reagan. Right. That's right. <laughs> Uh, Tom, my only thought is that when, dis I don't want to trivialize this, but when disposable income in the United States goes up in a presidential year, the party in power wins. It usually goes up about 4%, whoever's in or out. This year it went up 6 and the party in power won. I think these are basics, and I think they affect all elections. I think one of the things that is happening that perhaps we haven't caught up to yet in terms of understanding how fast it is changing in this country is the changing electorate that we're now dealing with. The disposable income of the young, the command that they now have of their own businesses, the shifting population in this country from the Northeast and the Midwest to the Southwest, the feeling that it's time to kind of reclaim their lives and reclaim their traditional values in many well, ways. Well, you know, Tom, these things take about a generation to change. That's right. The big realignments have taken about a generation to part. We've been 50 years since Roosevelt. I think it's overdue for change. We're able to call Minnesota, Roger. We're going to project the state of Minnesota. Here it is, 62% of the vote in in Minnesota. There it is. We Actually, we can't project it. We're just going to show you what the final numbers are in Minnesota, two-thirds. It looks like it's going to be very close all night long. We don't know whether Walter Mondale can win his own home state. We can now, I am told that we can, in fact, project Walter Mondale, the winner of the state of Minnesota. That is his home state. That is the single state that he will win tonight. It has 10 electoral votes. It is his home and his headquarters. It is the taproot of his whole political philosophy. Minnesota colored red tonight for Walter Mondale. He can claim his pride in his native state and in his neighbors and the people who sent him to Washington as a senator and elected him attorney general as well. And from that, he can claim some victory. So here's the Electoral College total one more time tonight. 13 for Walter Mondale, 525 for President Reagan. And the national vote, as we now have it, 77 percent of the vote is in. An 18-point lead for President Reagan and George Bush over Walter Mondale and Geraldine Ferraro, a landslide of really sizable proportions for the Republican ticket tonight. And we'll only know what is going to happen when they begin to confront this new Congress, 17 seats uh, that the Republicans picked up, two seats for the Democrats in the Senate. Well. I'm going to sound a little bit like a candidate here. Uh, this has been a long evening for all of us. We hope that you have learned and understood uh, how the election turned out and why it turned out that way. But let me say to all of the people that you couldn't see speaking to you who are behind the scenes here, we couldn't have done it without them. And to them, we are eternally grateful. And for all of you who joined us, we're grateful as well. You can tune in tomorrow morning at NBC News at sunrise and the Today Show and tomorrow night on NBC Nightly News and hear more. And we hope that you will. For now, on behalf of all of us at NBC News, I'm Tom Brokaw. Good night and good morning. <laughs>